Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome for the second day of the Rethinking Water event here live at Museu do Oriente in Lisbon. Bom dia a todos. Bem-vindos ao segundo dia do event Rethinking Water em direto do Museu do Oriente. Um, for those of you joining the event for the first time today, my name is um, Rui Catalão. I'll be your um, conductor today, so I'll be conducting the sessions. Um, and we're going to have several sessions on how through investment and innovation we can contribute towards um, a water smart Europe, um, promoting the reduction, the reclamation and the reuse of water resources. So overall we are rethinking how we use water. So today we will we'll focus on what is going on um, in the entrepreneurship arena, in the water sector, and dive into opportunities to finance and scale up water-related businesses. You will find the full agenda, including information about the speakers, through the QR code that you see now on the screen, but also for those of you here at the Museu do Oriente, also on the back of your lanyards. So this event is organized in the framework of the cross-sectoral activity Finding Innovative Solutions for Water Scarcity in Southern Europe, the EIT Water Scarcity Project, and counts with the collaboration of the Feed for Reuse Consortium, which yesterday had the chance to present the Feed for Reuse Water Reuse Day. If you didn't have the chance to join us yesterday, 
you will still be able to watch the recording uh, on the platform for several days. So the, the Rethinking Water event aims at building bridges between the scientific community, entrepreneurs, investment funds, and citizens. Whether you are here with us in Lisbon or watching online, uh, please take notes and share your questions in the chat box, and we will open some room for a Q&A in the end as well. We really hope you enjoy today's session. Um, and so without further ado, I am delighted to, de to give the floor to Carmen Galindo, uh, project manager at EIT Foods. We'll be conducting the session on InnoY scale at EIT water scarcity, supporting water innovators and entrepreneurs to the next level. During the session, you will get to know the, the award-winning companies in the 2021 edition. Carmen, welcome. Good Thank morning. And Good morning. the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rui, again. <laughs> and welcome, everybody. Um, hope you had a, a great night and you are full of energy because now we are going to have a marathon. Uh, and you will get to, to see what's going on in, 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 in the entrepreneur side. So this session is to, to showcase, so we are, we are going to have with us several uh, innovators and entrepreneurs that are proposing solutions to tackle water scarcity in Europe, across Europe, and with a special focus in Southern Europe. This part of the InnoWise uh, scale activities part of, the, uh, uh, of a larger program, the Finding of Innovative Solutions for, for Water Scarcity. For those of you that were not here, we did an overview yesterday, but for those of you dialing in for the first time, um, just to give you, I, I would like to give you just an overview of what this program is. So it's a multidisciplinary and uh, cross-sectoral uh, program uh, in which several EIT communities Communities from the European Institute of Innovation and Technology collaborate together to bring the, to bridge the gaps on on water management, water sustainability, and water efficiency. So we have with us in the consortia there is Climate Geek represented by Eva there. So say hi to her later if you want. Uh, EIT Digital and EIT uh, Manufacturing represented online by Blanca, Ivana, and Elena. EIT Food that's me. So feel free to reach out later. Uh, and also Athena Research Center. I don't see Lydia, but she will be here later. So you can also talk to her. Uh, and be Azul with Rafa and, and Tony there. So you can, you can talk to them uh, as well. So in this project, we do work to uh, support innovation with a group of experts. Gaetan, Maria Cristina, Francesco are here with us today. And um, they help us identifying the gaps, finding solutions, and uh, creating the tools to support innovation to bring, to bring the market. We also transfer that knowledge to build capabilities across the industrial, um, the, the industrial um, sector. And we support entrepreneurs to bring innovation into the market and to bring the solutions to, to, to create an impact. And we also do general campaigns for the general uh, outreach to raise awareness. So we are focusing now in the entrepreneurship side. How do we support entrepreneurs? Well, in the last, since the last launch of the program last year, we had two editions and we have supported 47 um, ventures since the start. Um, we have uh, these, these companies work in water management, water sustainability, waterless solutions uh, for different sectors. Because as we've mentioned yesterday, tackling water scarcity can only be done if we act in all the sectors at the same time. It's not only one in economical sector that needs solutions. Um, so you will find here companies from different uh, industries and targeting and giving responses to um, challenges in different industries. We support them. We have supported them so far. There are four pilots either ongoing or about to start. Uh, so we want these companies to have access to end user is one of the main limitations that they find in the right road to market. So giving um, the space for them to find a partner to test and to build and to grow their solution together is, is, is one of the key things that we can offer them. Um, we also have supported them for uh, through at least three months of uh, mentoring. Um, 
So they have been assigned uh, one mentor, which they had the opportunity to work hand for, during this time um, in the areas that they needed the most. So some of them would be IP protection, some of them business development, some other network building, uh, finding opportunities, pitching skills, uh, and all, all of that supported with horizontal trainings. So uh, depending on the cohort uh, and the needs of the specific cohort from last year and this year. And we also think visibility is a must and is something that they can benefit a lot from. So we do that with open events like today. Uh, and also not all the contest not all the participants are represented here. But if you want to know more on about them, you you will find the uh, competitions are available in YouTube. Um, and I think for that it's enough promotion of the program for now. Uh, it's time to start a little bit the, um, the party, because this space is for them and for the winners of this uh, InnoWise scale competition in 2021 uh, to showcase what they are doing. Before we go, there is one thing to clarify, and it's that for us, we, we want to give, to bring solutions to uh, support uh, entrepreneurs to reach the market by um, and, and for that, one of the things that we consider is that um, we've looked for solutions that respond to a real uh, market need, to a demand, to end users, so they can actually collaborate in the future. So we have shaped the program in three specific um, sectoral ch challenges. Of course, the first one in agriculture, we mentioned yesterday agriculture, 59% of the fresh wash water uh, resources in Europe. So agriculture is one of the challenges. And in this case, the case study was provided by uh, San Luca. San Luca is an international company producing fruits and vegetables. Um, from They are based in, in Valencia and they produce for uh, all around the world. They had several challenges. We had um, eight companies participating in this uh, case study. Um, and I think instead of me, it will be Fernando telling you what their challenges are. He couldn't join it, but... Hi everyone, this is Fernando from San Lucar, and I wanted to take this note to really thank EIT Foods for the coordination, the motivation, and the implementation of InnoWise uh, program. For sure, I wanted to congratulate all the startups that have participated and that have been uh, proposing different solutions for the challenge that we proposed uh, some months ago. So the challenge that we proposed was about how to become more sustainable and how to, let's say, improve our water management strategy. Uh, I could say that as main takeaways, uh, we have received much more ideas, much more interesting and innovative ideas for water management than what we thought. And this makes that uh, finally, at the end of the day, we're going to implement one of the solutions that have been proposed, but still we have many other ideas in the pipeline that we didn't have before and that we really want to implement after we have implemented, let's say, the current solution that we are implementing uh, nowadays. Um, the good thing of this solution, uh, the solution that we're going to, to implement, is that it's going to allow us to improve the efficiency usage in Murcia, southeastern uh, of Spain by 10 to 15 percent. This is very much important and not only this is that we're going to understand much better how we are using water. So yeah, we're very much motivated, very excited to keep on, let's say, working on this side. I wanted to thank everyone to provide us uh, these in insights and I really wanted to let's say, encourage you to keep on working on this sense, to keep on uh, helping and, and backing us up because it helps a lot uh, at the end of the day to be much more sustainable in the whole value chain. So thanks a lot, have a great day there in Lisbon and yeah, thanks a lot for having me in. Goodbye! Goodbye, Fernando. Uh, we hope you are having also a great morning. It's always a pleasure. So that's it. Uh, we are now uh, starting with uh, the showcase for agriculture case study. So I would like to invite to stage to Ari, Ari Camburis, co-founder and business development director of the French company Sinafis. 
uh, he, Sinafis offers farmers uh, information and, and, and the tools to manage water consumptions, reduce fertilizers, insecticides, and uh, achieve better yields at a lower cost. Sinafis has won the, first, uh, the, the second prize of 10,000 euros to grow their business. And the floor is yours, Aris. Congratulations. Uh, okay. I think uh, if you can use the microphone. This one? Yes. They will, for the people online. Hello. Okay. So thank you for having me. And, and um, so Synapis is a company that uh, was created four years ago. And it's based on real uh, time problems in agriculture uh, that are concerned with irrigation, pest control, soil composition, uh, pesticides. And we have 400 implement implementations of our solution over in over 100 farms uh, in France. So we're in all types of crops. The solution is to, our solution that we're proposed to San Lucar was to combine our sensor measuring systems with an agroecological approach in a, system, a systemic approach to uh, regenerative farming. So the idea was to increase soil fertility, to attract biodiversity, to monitor tree health, and all of that leading to better uh, orchard management. So the measure and monitor part is our solution, which is Cinesense Smart Agri. So it's a series of connected sensors that transmits data over a network and that you can consult on your personal uh, secured space on the internet. And the advantage is that we are really measuring the microclimate around the plants. So we have uh, a air temperature and humidity that is placed in the plant canopy. We have a soil temperature and humidity sensor that is placed in the root structure. And we have a leaf humectation structure, uh, sorry, sensor that is placed in the foliage. And the advantage is we're really measuring that environment that is in the field, in the plot, and in the trees. It's a direct measurement. <clears throat> it's not an, interpol an interpolation or a calculation. So this is the, just an example of the Cinesense uh, client interface, and you can see that we can make a differentiation between dew in the morning and periods of rain. So the advantages of just this system alone are that we're optimizing water resources, we're reducing the quantities of pesticides and uh, soil contamination, we're improving the flora and fauna uh, biodiversity, and we're increasing the soil and carbon levels. And all of that based on a low cost industrial solution. So agroecology is all about increasing the fertility of the soil. So it includes uh, techniques like using permanent ground cover, uh, no tilling or no plowing, uh, increasing biodiversity by planting hedges, uh, flowering hedges. The whole idea is to get to a auto-regenerating system, a circular ecosystem that, that, is, that um, <clears throat> is in permanent equilibrium. Uh, and, but all of this isn't just magic, we're using uh, established soil analysis methodologies as well. So this isn't just a sort of feel-good fantasy. We actually have concrete figures that show that we can increase uh, carbon material uh, over seven years by 1%, or yield, uh, for example, in wheat or corn by 8 or 12%. In uh, fruit uh, orchards, we've, got, we've achieved two or three days more in terms of pollinization productivity for bumblebees, because we know the temperatures in the plant canopy. Uh, in viticulture, for example, we've reduced the use of uh, pesticides and uh, chemical fertilization treatments by 25%. And in vegetable producers, they've reduced their water consumption by 20% with a better quality and a better, um, qu a better quality of uh, fruit or produce and a longer shelf life. So the cumulative impacts of this combined uh, uh, methodology are an increase in soil fertility and reduction in water consumption uh, or the, the knowledge of the microclimate that is around the orchard that's in the orchard uh, early pest detection uh, I'm not going to go through all of them reduce carbon footprints and reduce costs and this can be scaled up to any size um, any size uh, plot 
Uh, in terms of ecosystem services impacts, we're on better water retention, uh, on terms of uh, reduced water consumption, and a reduced carbon put footprint for both uh, desalinization plants and uh, electrical water pumps. Uh, the market is growing at an exponential rate, both for the ecosystem services market, as well as for the global market for sensor systems. Uh, in terms of myself, I'm the founder of Synophis. I've had 30 years in product and program management, uh, and we work very closely with uh, CVS, which, is found, which was founded by Jerome Corgi, um, and who is an expert in agroecology. So basically, you've got Synesense on the technology side, Thank you very much, Ari. Don't run away, don't run away. Ah. This is for you. <laughs> this is for you. That's, uh, it's the first time that we can celebrate this in person. So, at least, come on, come on. Thank you very much. What are your next, next steps? Our next steps are new projects uh, that are working on measuring uh, photosynthesis okay. and on measuring the um, the NPK carbon uh, content of the soil. Okay, so good luck. Good partnerships with uh, with other companies. Good as well. partnerships. So, if you are interested, reach out to him. Those that are in the chat, if you have any question, uh, we will go through your questions. And and if you leave an email, and is there something that can be interesting for them, for you, for whatever, we will make sure that the the question and the information reaches out to whoever needs to reach. So, thank you, Ari. Thank you, Cameron. Now, next in line, we have Tatiana Rodriguez, International Relations, Relations Officer from Secal Flor Sur. They have a, a patented, patented plant-based uh, solution, 100% natural materials, that acts as moisture buffer and nutrient kick starter for plants. Tatiana, she's online with us today. Uh, she couldn't make it, but She's gonna tell us what they are doing from Secal Floor. They have won the first prize of 10,000 euros for the next steps. Tatiana, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, really, thank you very much to Carmen, to EIT Food, to Via Azul, to all the core organizers of this challenging and really, really interesting program we have had the, the opportunity to, to follow during these months. Uh, well, um, unfortunately, I'm not able to share this uh, with you in person in Lisbon, but um, I'm sure I will uh, explain to you in shortly what we are, what we do, uh, a little bit of what we have tried to, to get uh, by participating with our solution in, in water scarcity. So we have a, a very clear mission. We have to combat climate change through a 100% natural uh, product and helping minimize the damage we are having with the problem of, of uh, containing the causes of the climate change right now. Uh, we have to reduce the production of plastic products and we have to seek for alternatives. We have a 100% natural product using uh, being used right now in four areas of activity. First of all, agriculture, in which we have participated in water scarcity. This has been our challenge. Uh, gardening and landscaping, green roofs and erosion control, which are also very big problems and challenges these days. Um, what are the properties of our panel? What is our panel? It's a, it's a very simple and very natural solution with a very good water absorption. It can store until 12 liters by square meter. It's not heavy at all and 100% ecological and biodegradable. So we are favoring uh, organic farming, circular economy and so on. And these are our three top features. We can save on irrigation up to 50%, on nutrients up to 30%, and we can reduce the salinity of soils and up to 
40%. And apart from these features, we have also all the additional advantages, uh, creates optimal growing conditions, the faster root growing in the soil, the pH improvement, and so on and so on. And for green roofs, uh, who, are, who is being one of our main challenges this year, this next year in 2022, in several countries, uh, we get to clean the air and to uh, improve the climate in the area and in the constructions. You have here two key, uh, some key figures. We have more than 200 projects being implemented right now uh, and having been implemented in the past in 19 countries. Uh, in Spain, concretely, we have more than 30. And here you are all the savings we have, uh, we have recorded in our results. Um, we have already uh, had uh, three European certificates. We are getting, uh, we are updating our, our patents and we are getting new, two new patents for processes and products. And um, of course we have competitors, but I, we think they are not direct and real competitors because uh, in fact, all the competitors have a common feature and which are, chemical components or waste, which is not biodegradable. Um, and on the contrary, we don't have anything of this. We have comparable products in the market, but that maybe they are cheaper, eco and easy to install, but second floor panels have a very, a very good storage capacity and the water scarcity is very, very much improved with our panels. So we think we are um, in conditions to, uh, to have a real impact in society, to have a real impact in environment and to help in the planet improve uh, his, uh, his path towards the future. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity of being a part of water scarcity. What are the, the next steps? Where are you? There. Uh, where are your next steps? Ah, she's gone. Bueno. No, I'm here. <laughs> ah, I'm there here. you are. Okay, yeah, you're here. <laughs> what are your next steps? <laughs> Well, uh, now we are starting in 2022. At the beginning, we are starting our new production plant in Malaga. Uh, and this is going to be the key point of next year for us. And we are also starting implementing uh, R&D um, actions, innovation and activities um, for, for the next year, for the next three, four years. And uh, we think we have to focus on environment and to, we have to focus on, on, on the objectives of Green Deal for going towards in the same direction. Okay. Good luck and, and thank you very much for, for joining us from uh, Malaga. So good luck with her. Thank you, okay. Carmen. Thank you. Next, we have with us today uh, Antonella Maggiori, CEO of AgroAnalytics. It's Agro is a hardware-free system putting together satellite, meteo, and topographic information with farmers' information, is that correct? Yes. Uh, and through machine learning, they can predict the water available on plot. So, Antonella, welcome. And the floor is yours. I break a bit the rules and I don't have a presentation, but I wanted to explain what we are doing um, like more natural without presentation. So as Carmen uh, said, my name is Antonella and there are my two co-founders, Fernando and Pablo. And first of all, I want to say thank you to Carmen. Uh, she has been supporting us du during the whole process and after the process. And to our mentor, Jose Antonio, uh, it was fundamental for us. And what we are doing, uh, we combine information from satellite, from crop information, weather station, and we use all this information to give recommendations where, when, and how much we irrigate. And when we found, we started uh, last year, and this is our first year of operation, and when we started, we found uh, that there were hardware solutions, software solutions, but uh, they didn't match, they didn't uh, combine this information. So, 
Agro is on the mission to automate the whole irrigation, irrigation process. And how we are doing? We are giving recommendations. Uh, we are uh, focused on agriculture, but our technology could be used uh, for a smart city, for example, urban gardens, and for a uh, golf cart. And we, can, we give this recommendation according to the um, irrigation system. So uh, we are working with different partnerships like IoT companies. Probably we will be working with some other solution that uh, we are in the program. For, uh, program, for example, with Iris, probably we will work together. And this is our main uh, vision to work everyone together to join all in one platform and to improve how the irrigation is going and where the agricult agriculture is moving. So thank you so much for, for the opportunity to, to be part of the program. And we are a very um, young team, but very motivated and energetic. So go for it. <laughs> thank you, Antonella. It's very, it's, it's very nice to see people motivated and, and with such a energy. So congratulations. Thank you so much. We haven't mentioned, I forgot, sorry, but uh, they have won the special prize. So in the future, they are. Fernando has been very secretive in the video, not mentioning any company because he knew it was going to be before the awards. But uh, they are the uh, team they will be co collaborating with in the next year. So good luck. Thank you. I, I didn't mention that as well. Because it was like, but yeah, we, we have started to work with Fernando to implement our solution, combining with a, another uh, like a hardware company. So we are working on that, and it's our um, for next year to implement the combined solution that we are building. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> and well, this was the first uh, sectoral challenge. Now, the second challenge was uh, in this case led by EIT Digital with Elena Online, and it was focusing on water management in uh, infrastructure. Similarly as before, uh, in this case, the case study was with the Italian Tip, uh, and it's going to be Claudio who explain us what the, their challenges are. If we can turn on. Thank you, one. director and manager, manager of wastewater treatment plants for CHIP, which is the water utility that manages the water and wastewater service for 59 municipalities located in the south area of the Marches region in the central Italy for the provinces of Ascoli Picera and Fermo. The territory on which CHIP performed its water utility service uh, was affected in 2016 by a terrible seismic event which caused many disruptions, including permanent ones, such as leaks in the main pipelines, uh, problems in tanks, uh, temporary changes in the uh, turbidity of the water, and so on. The effects of the earthquake combined with the water scarcity and draw uh, have not only affected water for human consumption. Actually, this experience has entered in a disruptive way into the lives of the entire population of the municipalities served by this water utility. For this reason, it was necessary and fundamental for all of us to question the role of an infrastructure as cheap. This meant also the beginning of a change in water resource uses. For this reason, uh, the main challenge that CHIP decided to address by participating in the wide-scale program was uh, to find an alternative way of using the water resource in an, an unconventional way, focusing on agricultural use uh, wherever possible. This experience was very positive. The program gave us this uh, opportunity and to meet uh, and get to know new companies and startups in different sectors, all related to our main business. It has allowed a small water utility such as CHIP to get in touch with new companies that, through R&D, brings innovative solutions to everyday working life, allowing uh, doing the same things in a smarter and faster way. At all stages of the journey through the program, we have found competence and attention to our problems, which have always provided us with answer and food for thought for the completion of the journey. For this reason, I would like to thank all the staff for the attention they have paid to us. Thank you. So. <laughs> thank you, Claudio Online. Um, I must say that the uh, cheap situation is one of the examples where 
we were discussing yesterday were uh, competition over water use and, and, and it's, uh, it's complicated. No? They are situated in a place uh, where they have a lot of agricultural uh, activity but also industrial and also high levels of, of tourism, especially in, uh, in the summer. So it's, uh, it, it, is, it was a very complete challenge. And now we start, in this case, uh, I would like to start with the um, showcase of the two, in this case, winners of the, um, of the uh, infrastructure competition. So Mateo, please come to stage. Mateo Dalamico is CEO and founder of the Italian company Mobigis. They have uh, produced or developed Water Jade, which integrates machine learning and physical based hydrological models. Mobigis, Matteo, here, they have won the first, um, the, the second prize with 10,000 euros for scaling up their business. And it's your time. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling great. Thank you're you. Feeling Thank you. Great. It's your time to yeah. explain what you're doing. Thank you. Yes. All right. So thank you, Carmen. Thank you again for having me here, also for joining this prestigious um, uh, conference on water scarcity. My name is Matteo Dalamico. I have uh, I'm the founder of MobiJS. I'm here to present our project WaterJade, the uh, digital solution for the water abstraction. How much water is there, and when will it become available? These are the questions that most water managers are asking to comply with water supply. Could be, uh, of course, water utilities, but also hydropower companies or even industrial companies that use water to cool the plants. Um, this is also the questions that we are likely to, to address with our solution. We implemented a technology that takes into account a variety of data sources like satellite data, in situ data, and numerical weather predictions that are using physical models and machine learning, where we have the catchment as our point of observation, not to probably the, the crop itself, but the catchment. And we provide a monitoring, a forecast, and optimization of the reservoir solution that takes into account the full water cycles from the snow in the mountains, if there is, to the water in the valley, uh, twice as much accuracy compared with uh, state-of-the-art techniques like the historical mean, uh, no installation whatsoever devices, and this can be globally scalable. This is uh, some examples. We are doing snow monitoring on the Alps um, uh, with an ESA project, and uh, this is important for hydropower companies. And also we are doing a discharge monitoring and reservoir monitoring through observation. And we are providing forecast of water in uh, river outlets or some plants locations for the next days or weeks. And also we provide a reservoir, uh, let's say simulator, that they, they can tell you if the reservoir is going to be affected by water scarcity in the next weeks or months. So here is a vision. We want to complement the current digital twin of the plant with the digital twin of the catchments. We want to extend the point of view of the company outside of the gates until the top of the mountain. Uh, how do we do this? We provide access to a dashboard where the, the customer can log in and see some uh, of the services, monitoring or forecast. So the, the benefits are uh, we, you can optimize the water abstraction and uh, takes into account complex plants, also the conduit, the presence of conduits of intakes of water and uh, helps you to comply with legal uh, let's say, legal um, uh, issues about civil protections or water scarcity, drought or floods, and also approved consultation with uh, public agencies. And it's totally uh, easy to implement with APIs and only one solution. So this is all for now. Thanks again to, to the program. It is uh, really prestigious to be here, and thank you again. Thank you very much, Mateo, and, and I wish you a lot of luck 
and you. what are your next steps? Okay, uh, the next steps is now uh, I've, I've been talking about water quantity. Uh, the next step is to provide also water quality. So through observation, maybe try to address problems with, uh, say, algae blooming and the temperature of the surface also in prediction to have the customers also have a complete idea of what is going to happen in the reservoir. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bueno. Okay. So the third and last, I promise, a challenge and sectoral challenge that uh, we discussed and, and we've been working on this year uh, was how what utilities uh, deal with, uh, with uh, there is a presentation, if you can put it, please. Um, so how uh, water utilities deal and, and, and are affected by, um, by water scarcity. In this case, um, the solution or the challenge provider was uh, the municipal water, uh, municipal water supply and sewerage company of Pialia. I hope I pronounced it correct, but if not, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> And I could explain you what are the challenges of, of a water utility are in, in real, but I could do, but we have Thomas from, uh, that came all the way from uh, Greece to be here with us today. So I think the best person to, to reply to these questions is, is him. Hello. So Thank you very a... much for the invitation. <laughs> Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, water is a common pool resources defined by Eleanor Armstrong. And uh, if you consider the uses of the water, for example, agriculture, industrial use, power supply, and residential use, then you come to the conclusion that water is life itself. Water utilities and water management is uh, another thing. It's a complex activity. It's a complex daily activity ranging from uh, water supply and availability to pipe failures, but also legislation, claims, and politics. But that is another thing. What That's a challenge. In that, I cannot help you. I'm sorry. I cannot help you either. <laughs> but uh, all these interconnected cycles, I call it rings, need one ring to bind them all like the Lord of the Rings. And that ring is uh, people and the ecosystem. If you provide sufficient information to people, well-trained people, then the outcome will be very good. Okay. So, and how are you? How, how are you working towards uh, uh, facing those challenges, and how to train people to give the information to? By participating in uh, uh, actions like InnoWise Scale. InnoWise Scale was a breakthrough for us. So, just to note, this was not prepared. Eh? So, <laughs> his. Uh, <laughs> you give me the money later. So, <laughs> that was. A breakthrough for us because we have the opportunity to cooperate, talk, and interact with six solution providers. I will call them because Drupal, MBO Diagnostics, Nanoplasmas, Fimpsen, Saip, and, uh, and Zinc. Yes. I think I, I have named I think, them all. Yeah. It was a very good procedure because at that point I came to realize that I thought I had some problems, but what I had is I was looking things the, right, the wrong way. So by rethinking what I am doing as a water utility, I came to the conclusion that we have to revise our uh, water management. And that is why we have participated uh, in InnoWise in scale. Yeah, I think we are very glad to, to hear this. Also, this challenge was led by uh, Climate Kick and Athena also uh, as part of the cross kick activity and we are very glad that companies like you can benefit and, and, and find the value in, in these initiatives. Taking advantage of you being here today, I think I'm going to give you my role and you can okay. do the uh, award ceremony for, uh, for, for the, the challenge. I will assist you with everything okay. that you need, okay? So I'll have to call on stage Mr. Marco Ferreira. He's the CEO of Fencing Making Solution. It's, uh, a pioneering Spanish uh, private company that uh, has developed uh, the first non-invasive software for uh, maintenance of motors so and mind, yes, but I will need the source code after that. No, no, no. <laughs> I forgot about that. 
Hello, thank you. So, uh, good morning. Thank you so much for your presence in this event, and thank you so much for, first of all, for ET and Thomas for all the support in the um, in the old program. Well, uh, starting for the team, uh, myself, I'm CEO of the Engine. Walter is here also. It's CSO of Engine and. Two more persons are, bought, are important in the team. It's Martin Simon, the founder of the team and the operational uh, guy, and George, the R&D guy, the guy you needed to pay to have the, the source code. <laughs> Just with one slide, I will try to concentrate all, all the information of Engine. We start uh, the company in 2011, and we are an innovative provider of uh, asset condition monitoring solutions for uh, monitoring of electric machines. Uh, with these asset condition monitoring solutions, we provide asset management, we provide fault detection, we provide predictive maintenance and energy efficiency solutions for the end users like, like the company of Thomas. What is innovative in this site? We uh, provide this for a numerous uh, applications. We are talking about rotating machines, transformers, uh, power uh, electronics, I'm talking for VSDs or I'm talking about the solar inverters. We provide this for solar PV plants, we provide this solution for wind turbines and uh, at this moment also for battery storage systems and we provide these solutions with one uh, source of information, electrical variables that are applicated to these machines, voltage and currents. And we measure these electrical uh, variables with non-invasive techniques. So non-invasive sensors for current uh, measurement and non-invasive sensors for uh, voltage. So with this, we do not uh, insert any kind of uh, sensor or we do not make uh, a sensor intrusive in any any of these machines. So we are completely non-invasive and with these electrical variables and monitoring electrical um, machines, we do not need to have learning periods and we do not need to have historical information about that machines. So we are completely agnostic for the human uh, mistakes and completely agnostic for the type of machine we are monitoring. Of course, our value proposition in these uh, solutions is to provide uh, a reduction of maintenance costs, a reduction of unplanned and downtime, uh, at the raise of potential uh, and the detection potential of future faults in this type of machines, and uh, also a reduction of almost 15% in terms of energy efficiency or energy waste um, conception. That's all. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I will present you with a 10 euro prize. Yes. 10,000 10, euro with prize. Euros, thank you so much. Now I have to call on stage uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Ingrid Nollet from SAPE. She is the Sustainability Manager of SAIP is an IoT and uh, IoT and I, AI uh, company from uh, Belgium, I think, yes. that uh, has a, a, a very advanced model for uh, retrofitting uh, water consumption, water leakages inside buildings, and also has a, a way, an established way for maintenance on these buildings. So the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having us. It's uh, quite an opportunity for us to, to be here and to meet all you uh, challenges, but also uh, expert in this uh, water sector domain. Uh, my name is Ingrid Nollet, so I'm the sustainability manager of SHAPE, and uh, our goal is to reduce the water consumption in buildings by 22%. And how we, do we do that? We tackle water loss. So we search the leaks, we tackle leaks in buildings. Um, yeah, will be a quite short presentation if I don't have this. 
So no news today for you because uh, we are talking about water shortages and uh, they are becoming more and more frequent. And this is due to climate change, to pollution and also to population growth. Um, water shortages are increasing and governments are looking for solutions. And it's quite difficult to provide a solution that is scalable, easy to use, and that assess leakages in buildings. This is where we want to uh, act today. And uh, there will be quite some examples uh, of, uh, of uh, big clients that we are uh, helping with their water losses. So uh, identified by the EU, uh, the building sector is using more than 70% of the water. And this is where we want to act, in the building sector. It's the private and the public sector, so it can go from schools to retail to municipalities, but also uh, at, we are also addressing water companies and insurance companies. One of the main examples that I like to share is the city of Brussels, uh, so capital here in Belgium, and uh, on the water bill of 1 million euro every year, 4,000 euros were uh, linked to water leaks. For now, every year they make huge economies, uh, more than 250,000 euros per year, because they are addressing the leaks uh, thanks to a technology. It goes from the small mannequin piece, I don't know if you have ever been to Brussels, so the little statue, and uh, to the big uh, football stadium. Every infrastructure can be uh, equipped with a solution, no matter their size or the use of the water they are doing. So we use the existing water meter to do that. Um, we want to detect leaks in real time and we want to facilitate the work of the maintenance teams. Um, the data is then translated to well used uh, and a really easy to use uh, solution that is our software. It's super intuitive and uh, it collects all the, the data thanks to an algorithm that we create ourselves. It's a, a SaaS uh, solution, so software as a service. And what I can say to you is that our clients are usually contracting for more than five years. So it's a very attractive product. It's easy to use. And, um, and what we want to offer is the peace of mind to the maintenance team. So all the people that are working uh, on the field that are looking for leaks, this is what we want to, to share to them. It's, the peace of mind that the work is automated. Um, the sectors, as I said, that we address are the prop tech sector, uh, the water tech sector, so we are uh, currently discussing with a lot of water companies in Belgium but also abroad. We are the main partner of uh, the Walloon water utility in Belgium, so for those who know a bit of Belgium, there are three regions, Wallonia is one of the biggest. And uh, we are also tackling the insure tech uh, sector um, because we can help uh, insurance to add uh, new services in their portfolio and help at the end they end cust uh, customers. Um, who, to the person that followed the presentation of Marta Lima yesterday, uh, she shared that um, more than 16 Olympic uh, pools uh, were wasted every day here in Portugal. What I can share uh, to you today is that uh, thanks to our solution, more than 1 billion liters of water were saved uh, since the four past year. This means uh, more than 12,000 leaks detected. It also means uh, more than 170 tons of CO2 emission avoided because producing and sanitation water is uh, also making a lot of CO2 emission. And um, in terms of uh, Olympic pools, it's uh, almost 300 Olympic pools, the water that it contains in the Olympic pools that was saved. So thank you for following our journey. Thank you for your attention. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm here the, the whole morning with you. So uh, don't hesitate. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, this is the first prize. Thank 12, you. 12,000 euros. Five euros, no? No. <laughs> I, I, could, I could have added three, 
thousand euro because uh, you exceeded the time, but that's something else. Oh, of how much? How much? <laughs> I can share. I can okay. share. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Ah, photo. <laughs> Merci à toi. Thank you. I now have to call uh, Mr. Javier Sanz. He is the CEO and founder of uh, Fibsen, a startup from Spain that uh, yeah, has developed a fiber optic sensor system for water monitoring. Hello. Hello. You just have one minute. <laughs> one minute only? Uh, so thank you, Thomas, for the introduction. And thank you, the organization, for the opportunity to introduce our project. So all the people know that water is important for life. And water scarcity is hitting the world. But currently, water companies are losing more than 20% of water in supply, and their operational costs have increased a lot in recent years. And this surprise, especially uh, because when we know that these water companies have spent a lot of money on trying to fix it. And what's happened? Uh, it happened that they don't know the real information of the facilities. Because currently monitoring systems are expensive and little reliable. So to solve this, we provide a real-time monitoring and predictive analysis that water companies can know the real state of water quality and their facility automatically and digitally, saving resources, cost, and ensuring water secure. And this is possible using a novel technique that can relate the changes of optical pulses as it travels along the fiber optic uh, to different phenomena. For instance, temperature, strength, pH, turbidity. And this is give us the opportunity to transform the fiber optic in a sensor array. And this is very important because it is uh, the opportunity to measure long distances with a low cost and low energy consumption. And other uh, advantages against electronic sensor is that we can create a simple and compact sensors and reduce the number of devices and the management cost. And also, and this is very important, is that fiber is immune to corrosion and have high resistance to water. In the market, we can find that electric sense is very expensive and little reliable. And on the other hand, our continual research and the collaboration with water companies and university are giving us the opportunity to create new sensors, new solutions, and improve the quality to currently uh, fiber optic sensing. Uh, this is the, our timeline that shows uh, that we love to collaborate with other institutions, and we are very active with research projects. And finally, focusing on the case of the app, the Thomas proposal. We are implementing a monitoring system in 1.3 kilometers that the water company can control uh, pressure, leaks, temperature, and security. And we hope that this system we can uh, improve the life of the civil uh, population. Uh, preserve resources and improve uh, hydraulic efficiency. So, thank you. Thank you, Javier. <laughs> I will present you with a special prize, the 30,000 euro prize for uh, the
pilot case in uh, Asbestochori, Thessaloniki. To improve the city and the, and the water. To make the best of it. Photo, okay. No? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very much, Thomas, Thank for you this very much. great uh, moderation. Okay. I think you can you could find a different uh, profession if you now. need. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, well, I always say, and I always thought that I had a super special and perfect memory, but um, that's not true, and no one realized. Only, um, well, no one realized. No, but no one told me, and you would think like. Okay, so you have three winners in one case, you have three winners in another. I announced it two for the case study of infrastructure, but only one showed up. So I would like to call to stage to Nuria Aguilera from Blue Fage. I'm sorry I forgot, but there is a, a, a nice reason. And is that uh, Nuria is here to represent here uh, today Blue Fage. They have won not only one prize, the first prize for the uh, TIPS case study, they have won also the special prize. So please, Nulia, <laughs> welcome, and, and I, I give you one extra minute. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Um, bon dia para todos. Uh, good morning, everyone. everybody. Sorry. Um, my name is Nuria Aguilera. I'm the commercial director at Bluefitch. Um, first of all, thank you for today's opportunity, and thank you very much for the awards. Um, yeah, at Bluefitch, we have developed the fastest um, kit for coliphage analysis in the market. Until now, all the water quality assessment has been performed using bacterial indicators. However, these indicators cannot detect the viral pathogens. And that is why it's really important to not only detect the fecal contamination, but also the viral contamination. And coliphages can do both. At Bluefage, we have, sorry, we have developed two family of products, the easy kits that are for a fast and simple implementation of the standard methods, and the rapid kit, a groundbreaking technology that is patented and allow you to obtain the results in just six hours of time and 10 minutes of hands-on time compared with the standard methods. As you can see, it's a huge improvement. Within this family of products, we have the qualitative kits that is absent and present, and the quantitative one. Let me show you how this technology works in a really short video for, sorry, the qualitative kit. Once that you buy the, the kit, you have two containers, the big bottle that in the cup you have the media, and the small vial where you have the um, E. coli, that the coli is the food for the coliphages. First of all, what we need to do is to resuspend the, the, the E. coli, just opening the cup that will release the biological material that is inside. In the meantime, that we are resuspending that, we can just prepare our sample. We just need to pour 100 milliliters of this sample into our BP testing bottle, and after that, we will need to press on the top of the cup in order to release the media that is inside, as you will see now in the video. Okay. Once that all the media is released, we just need to dissolve. It takes just two seconds, and we can add our foot into the... BP testing bottle. And the last step would be just incubate, just six hours of incubation compared with the standard methods that are 20 hours. And you will see now, sorry, I'm a little bit quicker than the video. Okay, after the incubation, if your bottle, if your sample turns out green, that means that your water is not safe. There is a, a presence of viruses. And if your bottle is yellow, it is safe. This is the qualitative one. With the quantitative, it's just the same. You just need to take a picture at the beginning and at the end. Upload these pictures in our um, app, and the results will come out directly, and you can also transfer these results automatically to your limb system. And this is a little bit what we do and who we are. 
Um, we are a spin-off from the Barcelona University. We were born in 2016, and since then we have been growing by the day, and we now have representatives in more than 15 countries, going from Singapore to Portugal. With regard to the challenge, um, our solution, I mean, our challenge was to perform a sanitation safety plan. And with our solution is to use our kits, our rapid kits, in order to um, check for one side using the qualitative ones to have a screening of the critical points and to understand what is the situation from the fecal and viral contamination and using the quantitative ones in order to control and monitor. Using the, our kits, you can check if your treatment in the wastewater is efficient because it will give you an idea of the, if there is any viruses, not only coliphages. Coliphages is just um, an indicator of the concentration of the rest of the viruses. And this is a really short summary about blue phage. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for today's opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nuria. And again, uh, you enjoy the, the, the extra. So <laughs> good you. luck. And, and good luck with also with the, with the challenge. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming here. And <laughs> before we move forward with the next session, you will think what is next? What these companies can, uh, what, what, what these companies can, uh, how these companies can enjoy being part of the community, how can we continue uh, together in, in the path. Uh, so I would like just to, to give you um, an overview. The EIT, the EIT is the largest European, is the Europe's largest innovation community and we are a network with over 1,500 uh, partners divided in different uh, innovation communities. So. Uh, for those of you that want to explore how to join, what can be done um, with each of us, uh, you can always contact us. So I'm representing EIT Food, Eva is representing Climate Kick, Blanca and Elena are representing Manufacturing and, and Digital Online. And each of us that have different opportunities and different uh, programs. So for instance, in EIT Food, we have a lot of uh, business creation activities that covers all the way through from ideation to uh, scale up through. Um, the Water Scarcity Project is one of the uh, more advanced uh, solutions, but also we have the Rise, uh, Rising Food Start Association. So if you want to know more, you can always uh, reach us also. Uh, in manufacturing, they also have um, all the business uh, creation opportunities for uh, companies tackling manufacturing uh, challenges. Uh, for those of you online, and this is if you are a water warrior, even if you are a corporate and you have a specific challenge that you want to, uh, to you want to find solutions, or if you are. Uh, startup scale up offering solutions, uh, please stay tuned because more opportunities will come next year. Having said so, I give the floor to Rui and thank you very much for the extra time. I didn't over much, <laughs> so it's fun. You're good. <laughs> so thank you very much, Carmen, and once again, congratulations to all uh, award winning companies. Um, it's amazing and it's very inspiring to see um, these, these companies uh, actually tackling water-related issues and contributing to change. And now on to the next section. Uh, I would like to call uh, Rafael Casieles, uh, project manager at BioAzul, who is going to conduct our next session. Okay. Welcome, Rafa. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks the a lot, everyone, for being here. Well, we have a very interesting session, I have to say. Uh, probably we have here the most promising uh, technologies and solutions in the, in the water sector. Um, and I will say that uh, innovation is essential to cope with water scarcity. But uh, as we have seen, uh, as suggested in the different sessions, uh, having a good solution, having a competitive technology is not enough to, to reach the market. 
uh, innovators, entrepreneurs, especially if they come from a small company, they have to face a lot of challenges. This so-called valley of death, uh, which is linked to the difficulties to, to fund uh, the scaling up process. And uh, I think this is one of the main roles of uh, the, e the EIT water scarcity pro uh, program, to help entrepreneurs in this uh, process, to uh, especially to make like solution providers, those who are having the technologies and the solutions, meet the problem owners, the problem holders. And uh, today we are having a, a session on a success story from this collaboration between problem holders and solution providers. I would like to call, to invite to the floor uh, Marta Carvalho from Aguas uh, de Portugal. Uh, Marta, she's a manager at the Innovation and Development uh, Department in Aguas de Portugal uh, Valor and uh, she has been expert in the body of knowledge in the last year program. And uh, as a mentor, please uh, have a seat. Thank you, Rafael. And uh, also Pablo Perez from uh, Aquacorp. Pablo is the CEO of Aquacorp uh, and also participated uh, in the last year program as a scale-up. Uh, you can take a seat if you want, Pablo. And, uh, and also in the mentoring program, I have to say that Pablo won the, uh, also, uh, was awarded with the prize of 10,000 euros. And Marta and Pablo were mentor and mentee, respectively, in the last year. So maybe we can have a seat and, and discuss. Um, first of all, I would like that you present yourself in a better way. You, you, you tell us what you do in your respective companies. Uh, for example, Marta, you can start. Uh, what, what do you do in Aguas de Portugal, uh, especially to cope with water scarcity? What, what are your main uh, initiatives and activities? Okay, thank you, Rafael. Thank you, first of all, for this kind of invitation to be here with you today uh, and to participating in this Rethinking uh, Water event. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here with you, all of you today. And particularly, it's also a pleasure because last year I had the opportunity to work with some of you, but only online. And today I had the opportunity to first see you in person, which is always much better. So uh, I, I, my background is on environmental engineering in water resources. And I've been working from the last more than 20 years in the urban water sector most of them working in Aguas Portugal Group. Uh, and nowadays, I'm the innovation catalyst within ADP Valor, which is a company that seeks to bring innovation into Aguas Portugal Group. Uh, just to give you a brief context, Aguas Portugal Group, for those of you who don't know us, uh, it's a state audit company funded in 1993 with the mission of building, design, designing, building and managing water supply and sanitation infrastructures in a framework of economical, social and environmental sustainability. We work here in Portugal, we represent about, we serve about 80% of the Portuguese population, this means 8 million people and we do it by 13 utilities, water and sanitation utilities. that are spread all over the, the Portuguese territory. Uh, we also work abroad uh, in other countries. We are about 3,400 3, people. Uh, and our vision for 2025 is to become one of the most sustainable and um, international water groups. Uh, by providing uh, excellent service, uh, resi uh, resilient infrastructures, innovation, and focusing also on, on uh, carbon neutrality and uh, uh, cir the circular economy. So in terms of water scarcity, mainly in the south part of the country, is a big issue from some of our companies, and we are always finding or trying to find new solutions, new approaches, to, to, to tackle that, that problem that we have. Okay, thank you, Marta. Pablo, you come from the entrepreneurship side. You are an innovator. Please uh, explain us what exactly it's your, your solution about. We, we are all ears. The floor is yours. First, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. It's a great pleasure and a great honor uh, sharing our experience, our success experience. Um, Aquacorp is a smart, uh, a small startup, and we are, uh, with all due respect, changing the rule of the game 
in a specific game, which is water quality monitoring. As you know, water quality monitoring is too costly. Overall, when you try to implement constantly, because traditionally to, to, to have a correct, adequate water quality monitoring, you need taking samples, go th through the laboratories, and you have the accurate measure for each parameter you, going to, you need to, to, to know. And at the same time, if you use uh, traditional probes with sensors, you have the problem you need. If you want to have a, con a, a continuous monitoring, you need to constantly uh, clean and calibrate these sensors. And what we are doing is uh, changing the rules. Why? Because we are developing a deep tech platform which is using external uh, water images. We don't need contact with the water. We use spectroscopy to know these water quality parameters, such as pH, conductivity, turbidity, suspended solid. We are 95% accurate in chemical oxygen demand. And what we are doing is this deep tech platform is using just a simple camera to continuous taking pictures with a frequency of five to 10 minutes, which means constant monitorization, means constant monitorization. You, you have the individual valor, the individual, um, the individual parameter with, with the individual value at every single moment. You don't need to compose uh, samples to know the average of, the, of this water. And this is a huge jump, technology speaking, we mix, we combine three different technologies. We combine um, hardware, IoT, is, 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 uh, is the first part. You need to take pictures, different kind of pictures, but pictures. In the second discipline, we use artificial intelligence and computer vision to process and to train these neural networks. And in the, in the third level, we combine the spectroscopy. We analyze how the water is behaving depending on the substance, depending on the spot, and depending on the context around this water. And this is what we are doing right now. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Pablo. Um, well, last year, Pablo was awarded in the, in, as part of the InnoWise um, program, and also he benefited from these uh, mentoring activities. Marta was indeed uh, your mentor. Um, and as, as part of this mentorship, you, you, you came up with a further relationship to test your technology in our the Portugal facilities. I would like you to tell me more, more about this experience of, uh, of the mentoring and also how, how you came up with, uh, uh, with this opportunity, because it was something spontaneous. Maybe, Pablo, you can start. Um, First of all, uh, uh, we won this prize thanks to Marta, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> we won this prize uh, <laughs> thanks to uh, the mentoring Marta gave us, gave us, for sure. This is very important to, to <laughs> emphasize because without Marta, we, we don't have, we don't, we don't, we didn't win the prize and we didn't stay here collaborating together. And secondly, uh, it was a great experience uh, overall because it was a, a tele-international experience. We won uh, Greece, uh, the, the prize, the Innovice Water Scarcity Prize at Greece. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we stay at home because the COVID situation. And it was a great and, challenge, and challenging uh, experience because, you know, international prize, uh, Working, tel uh, working from home uh, or receiving mentoring from home is not easy because here we are, we, we are, uh, we are talking, we are in presential, uh, we, we, we close this gap, uh, the technology is impossible to close. But the experience itself regarding the water, regarding the innovation and overall regarding how to start the internationalization process, having a good a good pilot, a perfect pilot, uh, out of your out of your country with a specific with a specific uh, early adopter or with a specific potential user, uh, such as Aguas de Portugal, as Marta said, is a huge. And this is the 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 main. I think this is one of the main reasons 
uh, because of uh, this kind of uh, programs of kind of calls uh, needs to continue doing things because I think it, it is a great a great uh, experience and we can demonstrate we can show you that it works mm -hmm. it works uh, we have here we have here um, creating a pilot no with a pilot created already uh, with Aguas de Portugal uh, using the technology developed in Spain for a, sm a small, very, very small sm startup because we are 20 people. Of course, we are growing, but uh, one year ago we are uh, 10 people. And, and then it, I think it's a great experience for all of us. Yeah. Great, thank you. Marta, how was this testing, piloting uh, period? How has been the, the collaboration with AquaCorp? Uh, can you please tell us a bit more about that? Of course, thank you. Pablo, you, you, I, I become a bit uh, uncomfortable, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not paying anything to you just to, to, to explain. So, um, first of all, uh, when I first heard about uh, Aquacorp solution, it made me very curious because this was something, it's like a, a game changer somehow, mm -hmm. and uh, I really wanted to learn more about it, and being Pablo's mentor was a, a a great way to do it. So um, this is the first step. I get to know Pablo. I get to know the solution a bit better. I get to know the startup a bit better. And this was a great opportunity. And from there, uh, since everything went well, why not uh, uh, test, if possible, the solution in real case scenarios in our company? Just to give you a context, we have more than 1,000 wastewater treatment plants. So finding uh, alternative uh, solutions to control water quality for us, it's a, a key issue and it's very important. So in terms of the pilots, uh, first of all, we, what we, we intended to do is to have uh, representativeness. So we decided to, to set three pilots. And from there, uh, the idea was to have three different wastewater treatment plants that have different uh, industrial contributions because the idea is to have a large spectrum of water quality conditions within those pilots. And we decided also to invite three of our different, uti three different utilities of the group in three different areas of the country in order also to test different contexts, regional contexts. And uh, from there, um, we, we, just to let you know, we found three totally different solutions. For instance, in the north, we, we found a, a, a wastewater treatment plant that has industrial uh, from textile uh, effluent, so the color there is an issue. We have uh, effluent that has one day green color and the next day a blue color, and it's all about the fabric colors that we have. <laughs> and uh, the second wastewater treatment plant is in Lisbon area. We've been there yesterday. It's also uh, it's a, a urban wastewater that has a, a very important industrial contribution also. And in there, our main problems regards to parameters like uh, total suspended solids or uh, chemical oxygen demands. And the third uh, infrastructure that we select is on the central part of Portugal, and uh, the main problems there regards uh, uh, it um, relates to having um, influence from the from restaurants, and so we have oils and grease and another uh, different uh, parameters that uh, are a concern for us. So being able to monitor all that uh, online and in situ allowed us to, uh, to adjust more rapid, rapidly the treatment process whenever necessary. Okay, thank you, Marta. And uh, Pablo, we, we, it seems a very win-win situation and uh, where you that are having a technology meet someone having a problem. How this relationship has benefited your, your business? How, how having a, this collaboration is helping you to, to reach the market, to put your technology uh, in, uh, in, uh, with other end users? I think uh, this is a, um, a change of dimension. 
-hmm. When you are in your country, you are developing uh, your technology, you are testing your technology with uh, users close to you, and it's cultural, administrative, economic, and overall geographical. Uh, these, uh, these, these, these aspects are too close. And when you change just uh, from Spain to, to Portugal, which is very, very, very short step, is the, the, the dimension change. Because not only uh, using this, uh, this, this, these differences in cultural, language, uh, economical, administrative, and overall geographical, but also because you need to uh, manage these uh, different uh, aspects in another different dimension of thinking. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, in Aquacorp it was the first step in the internationalization process. Every entrepreneur, every startup wants to internationalize, but we give the first step here and it's a challenge. These three pilots in three, in three different areas with, this, with these three different problems or needs are challenging. And when you manage this situation as a startup, as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, as I'm, I'm, am I, eh, the situation, your mind is changing. In Aquacorp, it is the first step in the internationalization process, real first step because we have a, a user in Aguas de Portugal we did with these different three pilots, and it helped us a lot to understand how we are going to, interna to interna internationalize. The next year, in 2022, we are going to continue interna international internationalize uh, the Aquacorp, starting from uh, Portugal, starting in, in, in Aguas de Portugal right now, but we are going to continue. And it experience, this experience are helping us, is helping us a lot. Good. I'm very happy to hear that. Um, uh, yes, as, a, any, as in any relationship, there are uh, yeah, good moments, but also there are challenges. You commented some of them. Marta, what, what's... What, what are the most challenges from your perspective in, the, in this collaboration? Okay, um, so we, we have a very technical challenge that it has always been there, which is uh, in order to, uh, to, to make uh, Aquacorp solution learn, we have to have a multi-parametric probe installed in our infrastructures. And very honestly, we don't have the best relation with this kind of probes, <laughs> if I can say so, because they always need to be cleaning, they, they need to be calibrated. And um, from my perspective, this has been the, the, the most difficult part because we didn't have any probe already in place and uh, functioning and calibrated in order to, to provide the necessary conditions for Aquacorp to start doing the testing. And this has been our main issue that we are still okay. trying to overcome in some yeah, of the plans. I con congratulate you to, to, to go through this process besides all, all the risk and the challenges. It's, it's remarkable. Um, just to finalize, I would like to ask you for maybe just a sh short final statement, maybe for a tweet to public uh, in the social media. How do you summarize this experience? Pablo, you may, <laughs> may, may start. <laughs> Thank you for these uh, programs, because uh, thanks to these programs and overall thanks to, to Marta, we are here and we are starting the internationalization. I would like to, fi to finalize the value of the data regarding water quality. Water uh, quantity is really important. It's really important for all of you, for all of us. It's really important, and water scarcity and this shortage of water is very important. But the value of data regarding water quality is unspendable. We Absolutely. don't know we we are drinking. We are <laughs> we don't know what kind of water we are drinking. We are using to drink our agriculture. We don't know with with kind of water are depositing at the effluents. It's very important the value of the data regarding water quality. This is very nice. Good. Marta, <laughs> if you also want to finalize with a short statement. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Pablo. This has been a challenge for both of us. I, I'm quite sure of it. It's a very uh, learning process, uh, ongoing learning process. And, but I believe this collaboration is aqua, with Aquacorp has, a be, has been a good starting point in ADP journey in order to build a water in, open innovation ecosystem where startups can have a, a, a key role. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you both for being here. Thank you. Um, I think we can continue Rui, with the next session. It was a pleasure to have these two entrepreneurs and, and uh, yeah, pioneers in this uh, kind of collaboration. Thank you very much, Marta and Pablo. Yeah. Right. An applause for them. Good. So, Rui, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rafael. Thank you also for, for, to Marta and to Pablo for, for presenting their success story. Um, so now it's actually time for a coffee break. For those of you at home, um, it's also an opportunity to step away from the screen a little bit. Uh, for those here, we'll be having a coffee upstairs on the fifth floor. In case you, you were here yesterday, you already know where it is. If it's your first time today, it's, it's just going upstairs from, from the end of the corridor. Um, we'll see you back at 11.25 local time, so time here in Portugal. For those of you joining uh, from Central Europe, that's uh, 12.25. And if you're dialing in from Eastern Europe, that's 1.25. So see you in a bit.
Welcome back, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed the break. I hope you, take, you took some time to, to rest and now to get ready for the second part of this morning session. Um, so earlier in the morning, we heard from the entrepreneurs that um, took part in the um, uh, InnoWise activities. They shared their inspiring uh, products and services. Um, InnoWise is, is a contribution to fostering entrepreneurship on water-related uh, ventures, to finding innovative solutions for water scarcity in Southern Europe. So for that, companies like yours just play a, a vital role in achieving Europe's green transition. Um, your products and services have the potential to contribute to European Commission sustainability and climate objectives, but still we are aware that many of you require long um, time to market and, and in terms of development and testing phases to prove the viability uh, in long term of your product or service. Uh, for that, we are also aware that your type of ventures has often limited support at a crucial moment of development. And that is why we have put together um, the following session, which aims to bring some clarity on where a company like the InnoY scale uh, participants can find financial support uh, for scaling up their water-related ventures. So please, Eva Enidi, uh, come to the stage. For those of you who were not here yesterday, uh, Eva is project manager at EIT Climate Kick, one of the partners in the Water Scarcity Project. Uh, Eva has coordinated the Body of Knowledge Expert Group, with, which produced uh, a white paper for water scarcity, analyzing policy, governance, and mapping um, and sorry, and technology solutions and, and the mapping of financial instruments available to startups, scale-ups, and SMEs offering solutions to water scarcity. She is here today to present the work done together with a group of experts to facilitate access to finance to water-related ventures. So, Eva, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rui. Thank you. you actually covered most of my presentation, so <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to talk about now. <laughs> So just to, to sum up, um, those of you who didn't hear me yesterday, as Rui said, I work for EIT Klamikik and we are one of the, the partners in uh, implementing the water scarcity uh, project in Southern Europe. Um, and as Carmen mentioned previously, we are a network of uh, knowledge and innovation communities and the one I work for, EIT Klamikik, is focusing on climate, uh, climate change related uh, societal issues. Um, we are innovating, um, we are working with a large network of partners to, to bring to the market climate innovation using system innovation, innovation as a tool. And within this project, uh, I presented yesterday uh, the, the outline of the white paper for the scarcity, which was focusing on policy, technology and governance uh, solutions to tackle water scarcity. And today I'm really glad to, to present the second uh, part of our work done by a smaller group of experts. And two of them will be represented today in the, in the round table. This work has been focusing on giving um, practical tools and, and very user-friendly knowledge to scale up startups and SMEs across Europe, not necessarily just Southern Europe, but all over Europe, who are looking for financial uh, tools and instruments and new ideas and, and ways to access finance to scale up and build, uh, I build their ideas and, and make a success in the market. And all of us with the objective of coming together to, to tackle climate change, but also water scarcity city and all, all the related, um, related subjects. And this is going to be one of the, the issues uh, our group is going to tackle uh, today. So I'm really glad to present the final result of our work this year um, called a Review of Financial Instruments uh, for Scale-Up Startups in the Water Sector. And uh, we will talk a little bit about the content, but just to give you um, a little um, flavor. The group has been looking um, into giving practical and easily available information that scale-ups can use to understand the different instruments which are available. And um, to give some examples, we have looked into grants, uh, bank lending, private equity, crowdfunding, 
And also, we wanted to expand a little bit the, the mindset and the, the opportunity scale-ups can uh, consider for looking for finance. And um, we have a, a separate chapter about which we call Think Big Pieces, because they are not the, the easiest and the most straightforward and the shortest uh, route for finance. But we, be, we strongly believe that these will uh, influence the future of financing landscapes for water scarcity. And with that, I would like to invite uh, my lovely uh, lady um, participants for, the, for this uh, roundtable. Maria, uh, if you would like to come, Gaetan and Lydia. Please take a seat. Yes. Um, so instead of me um, presenting you and your background, maybe I just give you the word to say a couple of words um, about yourself, and then I can move on to the questions. Maria, yeah. I'd like to start. Well, but really just a couple of, uh, of words uh, to give space to the discussion, which is extremely interesting. Um, well, uh, as I said yesterday, actually, uh, I am uh, a chemist in the background. So I'm coming from the technology side. But then uh, during the professional life, I had to develop also uh, business and innovation skills in a professional way because uh, you cannot be focused on innovation issues uh, without having a global perspective, a 360 perspective. So actually, uh, supporting industries in their development uh, from innovation to conventional technologies uh, intake, uh, really you need to know also which is the market in which you operate, which is the ambition that you have, which are the barriers and how you can act in order to overcome these barriers. And financial barriers are actually uh, one of the most challenging barriers within the water management and water scarcity issues. So that's me, Thank and you, I would go ahead with Gaetan. Thank you. Um, good morning. Good morning to our participants as well online. Uh, I'm Gaetan Suzanne. I've been in the water sector for 25 years, should I dare say. Um, and over the la I've done many things, but over the last five years, considering the subject today, I've put myself as a mission to really attract more money to the water startups and to the water sector in general. So I've been working with investment funds, uh, with public bodies, with startups on how to improve actually the flow of money to, to the water sector. And that's why I was keen to participate in this uh, initiative as well. Thank you. I must add that all of the participants here today with me, as an exception, in this roundtable have been involved in the project from the very beginning. From, so this is the, the second year for all of you. Mm -hmm. yes. And this is amazing to have you all in person to, to really be here with us. And uh, the last person, Lydia. Yes. Um, hello, I'm Lydia Papadaki. I'm here to, pre to represent Athena Research and Innovation Center. Athena is the leading uh, partner of EIT Climate Kick Hub Greece. And our main focus is on information technology. For Athena, innovation is in the core of our activities. Uh, that's why we try to support uh, innovation in all the phases of uh, the growth. Uh, in, this, in this way, water scarcity for us is a very important project because it gives the opportunity to startups uh, to step up, get into the market, and actually advance their ideas. And this is something we see with water scarcity for the last two years. But we also support projects such as the Climb Accelerator, Maritime Climb Accelerator, which focuses startups that are related to the maritime. We support Climathon, which helps citizens uh, come up with ideas. We help launch, but we, had, we, we help all the, um, all the innovation that can come from the society. And this is a very much open call for all the startups that are out there, that there are opportunities, and you really need Today we'll talk also about the financial, the, the financial stream uh, tools, but there are so many opportunities out there and all the startups need to be, keep an eye open for them because there are so many things we can do and only together we can uh, uh, 
uh, we can adapt to the climate change that is one of the biggest harms of our days. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you. And thank you all. So let's start with our first question, which is, uh, do you think that there has been a change in the availability of financing in the water sector? And the two of you um, have a lot of experience in the last uh, couple of decades, if I, I dare say. So what have you seen as a change? Do you want to start? Okay. okay. Well, a short answer is yes. <laughs> a longer answer is um, there is actually more money available. And as we have highlighted in, in the report that you have shown, uh, Eva, uh, we have actually money available for each stage of the company in its development. So this is the good news. The less good news is it's always difficult, and I'm sure if we were asking the scallops that presented this morning, it's difficult to start up a company. And the money available for that is not always ready because of the risk, obviously, linked to, to, the, um, to starting up a business. So um, in our report, we actually describe the money available for each stage in quite simple way with clear tips, I would say, on how to access it. And one tip is when you start up a business, always go for public subsidies to de-risk actually the first stages of, of your company. I think that's very important. And the other good news is that you have a range of different financing uh, we might want to talk about this, which is not always, you know, like black and white, meaning, you know, going for subsidies, grants, or for venture capital. But we can develop on this. Yes. Well, from my point of view, actually, in uh, the last 30 years, I would say, in my case, uh, I could see many, many changes in the financing instruments. And what I can say is that, luckily, we had an implementation of these instruments, uh, and we didn't have any cancellation of the previous ones. Uh, that is, in my opinion, a good signal, because this means that the European Commission and also the other bodies, uh, which can be the actors of this financing, could understand that according to the type of sectors, we might need different instruments and we might cover some gaps which were not seen in the beginning as none of us had experience in financing these kind of sectors. When we speak about water, actually we speak about a non-profitable sector, at least from a surface level perspective. Then, if we go into the deepness of the matter, we can recognize that both in the technology as well as in the supply chain connected issues, there are many opportunities for profitability. I can recognize, let's say, four pillars in this 30 years experience within mainly the chemical industry. The first pillar, in my opinion, was uh, represented by the transition from the solvent-based technologies to the water-based technologies, which was seen for in the beginning as an environmental step forward because water is uh, nature, while organic solvents were something dangerous for human health. And this generated the problem, actually, because then after this transition, we had to face the problem of water treatment to make water suitable for discharging into the natural rivers, into the natural uh, basins. And that was one of the first leverage for financial instruments. I still remember the Frame Program 7 which was facing, for instance, the problem of uh, the biocidal uh, uh, production problem, program, in which there was the issue of removing this kind of dangerous pollutants. 
And these were the first signals, frame program seven, before these national funding programs in order to facilitate the industries in uh, treating the water out of their uh, industrial sites. And then uh, what I really liked was uh, the appearance of the LIFE program within the financing tools. Because LIFE program was really entering the industrial uh, technology transfer of all these R&D innovation steps. LIFE program, which was generated by the need of a carbon footprint monitored process at different perspective levels, gave, in my opinion, a push to the additional financial instruments. And then we have nowadays, beside these public financing systems, also the private financing systems, which are interesting in the perspective uh, of uh, sustainability issues uh, and social beneficial uh, uh, sectors uh, where profitability has to be seen in a more complex way. So I can see a development and we will see, thanks to our instrument and to our distinction, how we can place our projects and our, our let's say, targets within the different instruments available. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Adam. Lydia, do you have anything to add from the Greek perspective? Yeah, so in the Greek ecosystem, what we see is that uh, there are so many good ideas, there's so much research out there, and all this is not monetized. All this, m most of the research out there doesn't manage to continue from all the FP7s, as you said, the horizons, the 2020. It doesn't manage to to, pr to proceed, to become, uh, to go to the next level and get into the market. So this is why it's really all these programs like uh, the water scarcity, the accelerator of water scarcity are so important because they, they give this opportunity, they give this space to all these ideas, to all this innovation to get into the market and actually solve real problems, which is the main reason why we do research in the first place. So this is, uh, this is something that is not... Uh, I think it's not just a characteristic of the Greek context, but it's an international um, uh, trend that we see, and this is why we need more and more opportunities like the one we, we, we offer here. Thank you. So I think this takes us to the next question, which I'm sure all stars us want to know. How do you get access to this money that we say there is so much of? <laughs> well, it's a full-time job. <laughs> To make a short answer. <laughs> <laughs> a longer answer is, um, I think, you know, the, the tip that we give also in our report, and I really um, encourage you to, to get access to it when it's going to be out, it's really to be prepared. Um, we are seeing too many startups sort of sending, you know, decks to different investors thinking, well, I'm sure one of them will respond. That's not really the way it works anymore because you actually work into a competitive environment. And this competitive environment actually is more complex because of the range of instruments now that you have available. As I was saying in my introduction, you have public and private money, but you have also have impact funds. You also have money if you want to demonstrate your technology. Uh, more and more you can have debt venture. So the range of instruments is actually wider, which makes the environment a bit more complex, but the opportunity is also larger. So really, this is a f that's why I was saying it's a full-time job, because you will have to research which type of instruments is actually fit for purpose, which one is best for you. What kind of instruments do you want to have in the long term? And if you go, for instance, for private investors, it's like a marriage for the good and for the bad. So you know that you're going to be living with these people for a while, and that's why, as I said, you need to be prepared for it. So it's just to make sure that you tick some boxes. And if I just give an example, um, which is the one obviously I handle best, which is venture capital, just make sure that you have a robust business plan with the right assumptions, 
with the right team, with the right market traction. Um, I know it sounds really basic, but I review a lot of DEC a year. <laughs> and I can tell you that it's not that straightforward. So really, access, accessing the money is not the problem. The way that you do it is actually um, what you need to be taking care of. Thank you. Yes. Well, I would add that beside and implementing what Gaetan has just said, I would make an eye as well on the IPR issues, for instance, intellectual property rights management, which all of you have to deal with being innovators as startups and scale-ups. When you chose, you have to choose your investors. The IPR management is already influencing your choice because you have to know that if you go for venture capital or for a joint venture with a big company, there you have to negotiate the property of your results. While if you still want to keep your rights and to use them for the development of your company, you can also go for other financial instruments which have not been considered so far so much, but they are becoming more and more interesting because water is not only a component, a chemical molecule, it's not just this. It is also a social value. So you can think about uh, applying for crowdfunding systems. Crowdfunding is not only for social civil rights, it's also for economic uh, sectors. And uh, you have to be careful about the selection of these crowdfunding platforms. And you will see in this report that we have uh, tried the first uh, selection of the existing ones because they are already focused on specific sectors. So this could be another way of financing your activity without exposing yourself or I would rather say keeping the possibility to manage your own rights and to negotiate how to deal with them. So this is another instrument, another example. In addition, looking at your project, I would say this is from my experience that considering the high level of innovation of your uh, proposals, of your uh, solutions, <coughs> and uh, the niche market you are uh, speaking about in terms of uh, profitability and profit makers and profit generating market, I would suggest to consider in your business plan also the spillover effects of your solutions in order to recognize any other segments which are at the moment already present on the market, which could get a benefit from adopting your technology. This could be a money generator instrument which allows you to enter with your proposal and to develop it to the further level of your company. So this is something else. In addition, I would suggest to consider in your business plan also the analysis of uh, the counterfactual scenarios. I mean, listen, investor, maybe you don't see the profit immediately, but think about what's going to happen if you don't adopt my technology, which could be the negative impacts, which, uh, which could be the, uh, the lack of benefit, uh, the damage, and so you can use these tools in order to offer your solution as a profit generator in a different way. Thank you. Lydia. Uh, yes, on top of what Maria Cristina just uh, said, I would like to add another tool that uh, most of the times is paragonized, and this is about the research proposals, and I'm talking about horizons. So right now there is a lot of space for innovations, for startups, for actual case studies, to join, to be part of the Horizon proposals and claim a significant amount of funding which can be used for their pilot. To do that, a startup need, needs to 
uh, create synergies, to partner up with strong institutions that are relevant and interested into their work, and contribute in the proposal writing claiming this funding. This is another stream that most of the times is not seen because we think that it's only for research, but right now Europe uh, puts a lot of uh, interest and a lot of effort on the implementation of the research and how the startups can actually be part of the solution. Absolutely. This is also a large part of our, our paper. So it has been uh, described by one of our colleagues, Paulina, uh, who is unfortunately not here with us today. But uh, we did consider, and we absolutely agree with you, that uh, Horizon and, and other research proposals are a good, a, a very good lower risk option for, for startups and scale-ups to, to trial out their ideas. Yeah, if I may add maybe two quick points. Um, Actually, you're absolutely right, Maria Cristina, about the spillover effects. And I think one of the good news as well for the water sector is that you have now climate tech funds, um, more and more money directed to water or adaptation to climate change and as a side effect uh, to water scarcity. So investors in general are much more now sensitive to this kind of issues than they used to be. So I think that's a real opportunity for actually raising funds. That's number one. My second remarks um, is about planning. Too many startups sort of start worrying about money when they don't have, or when they see actually the money on their bank account going down. Well, you should actually raise funds when you are rich because that's when you can actually negotiate so don't wait until you face the wall to plan your fundraising. And really, you should be thinking long term. So I know it's a balance between long term and short term. And I know that you have short term objectives and short term challenges. But really, what you should be doing is thinking long term and what you want to do with your company. I think that's the two key points which are very important. Thank you all. So um, I just wanted to check how much time we have because we did start a little bit. Four minutes. Five. No. Five. There is a bit of flexibility there. <laughs> so I would like to ask if anyone here would like to ask a question to our panel. Uh, Francesco. Yes, I can also summarize your question after. Oh, wait, the microphone is coming. <laughs> well, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting panel. Uh, well, within our activity of the ICT for Water cluster, it is a European cluster for uh, digital solutions for water, I am co leading the action group on uh, business models. And uh, we gathered. Uh, information from many Horizon projects uh, about digital solutions. Many of the startups here are delivering digital solutions. One of the points of the business models was uh, how difficult it is to actually quantify the return of investment uh, of digital solution in water sector uh, because uh, there is no proof of evidence that that return of investment is becoming true in the time that is planned. So uh, that's why the water utilities, especially, but not only, water users, uh, water operators, uh, are not very confident in investing. They are trying. It's still a niche market, but uh, they are not confident in the business plan that uh, they are analyzing. So what's your thought about uh, how we can be more sure, certain about this return on investment for digital solutions, especially? Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Well, as uh, we mentioned uh, before, within the business plan, it is extremely important uh, for this kind of sector to consider the technology as uh, a technology which can have different applications. I mean, the, the, the variety. Oops. OK. <laughs> And uh, so, uh, really, uh, it is an added value to what's happening. <laughs> There's a ghost. <laughs> so it's an added value, really, to consider the different uh, uh, applications, the different uh, 
also the different type of waters in which the technology can be applied. And this is really giving an added value to the business plan without touching so much the investment level. This is impacting more into the turnover and the operating results level. And this is important in order to be attractive for investors. And this is why we mentioned these spillover effects. Spillovers can also be envisioned. You don't need to have already spillover effects existent in the various sectors beside your core one. You need to have a clear vision about where your technology can be developed beside this. Yesterday, you were speaking about, in the Fit for the Use project, you were speaking about the MIPS application, the molecular imprinted polymers. So this is really a niche application if you consider it within the water, but MIPS can be applied in many other sectors and in many other type of waters, which can be industrial waters out of pharmaceutical developments, for instance. In, in, um, uh, in, uh, with the ambition to reduce the level of treatment of the water that you then need to apply at uh, the, water, uh, uh, the water station, the water treatment station, the public water treatment station. So really, this exercise uh, can give you an added value. We all know that uh, water treatment plants uh, are absorbing a lot of energy. If uh, we can reduce uh, the quantity of energy by requiring a, level, uh, a lower level of treatment of the water and acting above at industrial level by offering these technologies to industrial actors to treat their waters inside, this could be something which enrich your business plan and uh, can make it attractive for uh, the uh, public operator, for instance, and the water public service. Uh, just to give an example. One short answer, again. <laughs> exactly what I was saying yesterday during your panel, replicability. Investors actually like digital because it's not capex intensive. So you don't need to put a lot of money, actually, like for wastewater treatment equipment, for instance, or things like that. The trouble is, in the water sector, is the scale-up and the replicability. So if you can prove that your solution can be deployed, for instance, at the city level or in several cities, then it will become attractive. And that, I think, if there is one key conclusion also in all of this is how we can actually mobilize, and I'm looking at Marta as well with Aguas de Portugal, um, how actually the end users can help us deploy at large scale the good solutions. And then we will attract the money. <laughs> Thank you. I think this is the best way to, to close up our round table. Also, we are out of time. Uh, so. Thank you, everyone, for, for being here today. And obviously, the, the two of you and the, the experts who are not here today for the amazing work uh, that has gone into the two publications. So I'm really happy to announce that we are very hopeful to be able to share the access online to both publications in the coming days. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, raising funds is definitely um, not a very easy task. Uh, it takes a lot of time, as Gaetan said. Uh, it's a full-time job. So it's, it was very useful, very interesting to, to hear how entrepreneurs in the water field sector can actually access finance to support their uh, development. Um, then on a, on a different note, um, I would like to ask if you, if you did you know that 75% uh, of our jobs actually depends on availability of quality of water? 
Did you know that? Probably you don't. Um, water is indeed the lifeblood of our economy as well as of nature and the health and well-being of citizens. Um, the increased exposure to water scarcity worldwide will bring environmental degradation and competition for water use for agricultural, domestic and industrial purposes, which overall will have an impact on the socioeconomic development. Um, having said this, I would like to invite Ivana Lukakova to join us online. Ivana is a project manager at EIT Manufacturing, uh, the project partner leading the educational and capacity building activities. Um, sharing knowledge and access to education are key to empower current and future leaders of the European industry to contribute to a water smart Europe. With Ivana, we are going to explore how much we do actually know about water management. Ivana, welcome. Can you hear us? Good afternoon. Uh, do you hear me well? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, as I uh, said already, my name is Ivana Lukachova, and I am EIT Manufacturing Project Manager for CrossKick Projects, uh, mainly focused on education. Uh, I would like to start with an apology for not being able to join you um, during this event on site um, due to the COVID restrictions, so we are currently in lockdown. Uh, but I hope you will enjoy my online contribution and please feel free to reach out to us uh, via email or LinkedIn. We will be very happy to interact. But before diving into the water topic, I would like to introduce um, our EAT Manufacturing Innovation Community. So I'll go to the next slide which is not working. Okay. So um, we are a very new community and um, we are only uh, second year implementing our projects. Uh, EAT Manufacturing was uh, founded in uh, 2019 uh, and um, our community is built on three plus one main pillars. Uh, those are education, business creation, innovation, and regional innovation scheme. Uh, the goal is to build strong innovation network and especially around the knowledge triangle made of academia, RTOs, industry. And we also aim at helping moderate innovators from these countries to become part of the stronger innovation community. And how we want to accomplish this? Well, it's a big task, but um, first of all, we try to build Competitive manufacturing skills, uh, which are leading to social um, sustainability and responsibility. But we also do want to improve um, green skills because we want to make uh, manufacturing to um, contribute to the uh, green deal, to the climate neutral uh, economic goals, um, which we first uh, want to accomplish as a, as a community. But we want to also, of course, um, reach the, the world impact. And this is only possible through digitalization and innovation, which both will lead uh, to the one uh, mission, making Europe to be competitive and economically stable region. Our uh, four, four main focus areas are uh, flexible production systems. Um, I will make make it like this, uh, low environmental footprints, digital and collaborative solutions, and human machine co-working. And here is also the answer why we do deliver the water academies, because one of our flagship is actually focused on the low environmental footprint. And um, this is also connected to the uh, water security, because water security means production security. Uh, we have heard today several uh, uh, really interesting um, uh, contributions and sessions on, on the platforms which are available for the experts to interact, share the knowledge. One of these platforms in EAT manufacturing is Agora. This is a pan-European um, networking space where experts can share uh, the ideas or project proposals or any kind of interesting um, insights or ideas. Uh, this is the platform where internal uh, and external experts uh, can interact. And our big uh, mission is to develop also learning, uh, guided learning platform where we would like to um, deliver learning nuggets and also learning paths 
to um, help young and uh, all senior professionals to receive the up-to-date knowledge in manufacturing areas. But we also do uh, deliver our Water Academy 2021 through this platform. So all the real-time events, uh, they are recorded and then stored in this platform. Maybe some brief overview about um, the Water Academies. So uh, the first year of project implementation for AT Infection was 2020. So it was also our kickoff year for Water Academies. We delivered three workshops. Uh, the plan for 2020 uh, was to deliver uh, content focused on the region. So each Water Academy workshop was delivered in the local language, focusing on the countries which are heavily imp uh, impacted by water scarcity. So it was... Um, country like Greek, Greece, Italy, and Spain. Uh, we had all together 15 sessions um, delivered by 14 water experts. Uh, we had uh, more than 300 registration, but actual participants who were connected for at least one hour uh, was uh, like 119. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we delivered each water academy session in the local language, so Greek, Italian, and Spanish, plus we had interpreting um, in, in English. And uh, if you would like to maybe have a look at the, at the content, uh, it's available at the EAT Manufacturing YouTube channel. It's for free. And we already reached um, more than 25,000 uh, views. As for the content, uh, so each Water Academy had very similar structure. Uh, it was the first year, so we would like to, we wanted to kind of create introduction about like water scarcity, which areas are impacted the most, who are the the biggest contributors and which platforms are there to um, to interact and uh, to learn more or maybe you know um, to um, connect the uh, stakeholders uh, that those could be experts in water or those could be innovators who provide the water, uh, water technologies or those could be the consumers if, uh, any industry which is in need of any kind of technology so the morning session was focused on um, general facts and data about uh, water scarcity. Uh, then we had a session uh, on European Green Deal, so the climate policies. And then in the afternoon, we had three breakout sessions so um, our stakeholders could decide whether they, they joined the uh, water scarcity for the agriculture, water scarcity for urban uh, areas or industry. Similar concept was for the Italian Water Academy, so introduction, European Green Deal, but all focus on the on the country uh, of the main um, interest of the stakeholders. And uh, as I as I mentioned, uh, we also kind of touched um, the, the topic of like what uh, solutions are available. So we are talking about water use, recycling, nature based solutions, uh, how cities can go circular. But it was all in a like very um, a light touch. Uh, Spanish Water Academy, similar concept. Of course, each uh, um, each trainer um, delivered the content, which is especially important for those stakeholders in that particular region. And I'm very happy to see the very familiar uh, faces. So um, I would like to also express again that the success of the Water Academy 2020 was uh, the effort of all the of the older water experts who, who help us and who contributed with their um, lectures. Water Academy 2021, uh, we also delivered three workshops, but this time not focus on the regions, but focus on the sectors. So the first uh, Water Academy workshop was focused on agri-food uh, sector. Uh, the, the second was focused on the water utilities, municipalities, and partly also on the tourism sector. And the third workshop was uh, more focused on the industrial manufacturing and oil and gas. We had 12 water experts, 21 water re related sessions, and all were stored in the skills move where it's uh, now available for free. The content is available for free only until December 5th. So yeah, it's, <laughs> it's only three more days uh, when um, our stakeholders can enjoy the free content and also they can um, get a free certificate if they take the online course. And so far we had three, uh, 389 actual participants. 
Mm, but the, mm, but this curves or the content is going to be available in the platform. Also, uh, after we uh, close it, uh, close the free content, uh, and from December 13, if you would like to um, have a look at the Water Academy sessions, um, you will be charged 30 euros for all three workshops or 15 euros per one workshop. We will we will talk about it uh, at the end. Um, how to how to sign up for this platform and um, uh, how you can maybe look up for the the water academy workshop uh, and the learning facts there. As for the content, um, the water academy for agri food sector. Um, so each workshop was kicked off by our CLC ELS the director Anthony Bijuan. Uh, then. Uh, each uh, workshop had also opening session uh, about economic and business, business implications. And we also made mandatory session on the digital technologies for water management, because this is something what we still believe is um, not very well um, um, uh, discovered area uh, among the stakeholders. So digital twin and IoT for water management was introduced by EAT manufacturing partners and the reply. And then also, uh, afternoon sessions were focused on emerging technologies, risk to sustainable agriculture, Horizon Europe, um, how can help uh, the, the program help uh, our industries to become sustainable and competitive. Uh, then we also addressed water footprints and biotechnical treatment and valorization of food and beverage industry wastewater. The second workshop was for the um, manufacturing industries. So um, again, the kickoff was by, done by um, Anthony Bijuan. Then we had the uh, economic and business implications for Industry 4.0, uh, water management, um, and uh, the, the benefit of the digital twins, uh, circular approach for sustainable management of industrial water pollution, produce water management in oil and gas, current treatment technologies for textile and health and pharma. And uh, Gata Nesitzanet, who was also engaged in the panel discussion, that was an amazing session on new energy sources for the future. So very innovative uh, approaches and uh, very new content. And the last session was delivered by water scarcity effects on the energy sector, delivered, delivered also by a very familiar uh, expert, uh, Stella Sani. And uh, I really appreciate all the contributions because we really received very positive feedback. And last but not least, the Water Academy workshop for the utilities and municipalities um, delivered the session on uh, water risks. Uh, so we had um, an amazing expert, uh, Jennifer, who, who was engaged uh, in the um, different kind of projects uh, on uh, water risk management. She's having her own uh, water risk uh, course. Uh, she, great, she did a great job, uh, uh, and also the, the digital twins were um, introduced. Uh, how, I mean, in terms of like um, managing water in uh, water utilities and uh, how municipalities can also benefit from it. Design and operation of the water distribution network was uh, delivered by Dr. Bielka from Poland. Amazing session as well. Very difficult content, but delivered in a simple way and um, I really I really appreciate that each uh, each expert was trying to deliver it in a very comprehensive way. Uh, the same was uh, for improving water efficiency in buildings. Uh, we had also expert on nature-based solutions and again Stella Tani delivered a great session on EU framework for water resources management and um, uh, Dubra Kaskunca delivered again uh, um, amazing lecture on life cycle assessments, circular economy and water, especially focused on the small players. Okay, so now it's going to be the fun part. I would like to uh, kindly ask you to um, join the Slido uh, for a quick survey. I would like you to uh, let me know how would you assess your knowledge on water scarcity. So if you go to slido.com and you use the, the code 576011, you should be able to see the poll. I will also try to go there. Okay. 
Okay. All right. So uh, is it working? All right, I see that we have a champion here. What about the rest? Maybe you still need some time. All right. Great, so I see 14 people already joining us, 15. Okay, 10 more seconds. <laughs> I see that we have a lot of champions here. So we will see, because now the next part is going to be um, a quiz where I prepare different kind of questions for you to test how much um, do you know about the water scarcity effects and uh, how we can handle the water scarcity. So the next thing is uh, joining the quiz. All right. I see. Okay, this is cheating because Gatton and you were take, taking uh, part in delivering the session. So, <laughs> but okay. I see Eva, Lydia. All right. So let's start with the first question. So, if 1,000 people all together waste 1,000 kilo of bovine meat per year, how many liters of water was wasted with the production of this bovine meat? So, All right, 12 people, 14, 15 people, 17, 18, 19. All right, so 28 people are connected in the quiz and we still have only 20 answers. We have a lot of questions uh, ahead, so just try to guess. Good, so most of you voted for 15 millions. And I must say, it's a correct answer. So great. Uh, those who voted the wrong answer, I would recommend a session of Tuprak Kunza on um, implications, uh, water scarcity implication for uh, economic um, and uh, business uh, development of businesses. So go ahead and um, enjoy this session in the SkillsMove platform. The second question, what percentage of sustainability driven shoppers would be willing to pay 30% more for sustainable and environmentally responsible purchases? All right, this is just a guess, I guess. Uh, so it's 20% who is the winner in the audience, but in fact, 70% is the correct answer. So we can imagine 70% of the shoppers would um, support you as the business owner if you do care about the responsible purchases. That's a quite big indicator for uh, business owners how to market their products uh, that they are green and responsible. 
All right, we go to the second um, session uh, delivered by ET Manufacturing Partner Center Lipai. It's focused on digital technologies. So, which of the following statements about digital twins is not true? Okay, I see that people are a little bit struggling because we have only half people engaged. So, all right, uh, digital twin can operate without any interaction with the real world. Wow. The correct answer is definitely digital can, uh, digital can uh, operate without any interaction. But of course, um, maybe this is a little bit uh, confusing uh, question because it's about not true. So digital twin has to oper uh, operate uh, with the interaction um, with the real world. Okay, so the second question is, artific artific artificial intelligence can be applied to digital twin to forecast future behaviors and categorize anomalies. anomalies. Which of the following ones are not AI algorithms for digital twin? I see 10 people, 14. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try again. Can you hear me, Ivana? Yes. This is Carmen. Hi, you are really testing our knowledge, eh? You're putting it difficult, you, have, you cannot see us, but they are all very concentrating, trying to, to find the right, uh, <laughs> the right answer. Okay, all right, so let, but we have to move faster because I have a lot of questions and we are on the fourth one only. So. All right, I see that here um, we will have a trouble because 43 people answered the wrong way because it's a binary tree. If you want to learn why your answer was wrong, please join the session on, about digital twins um, in all three workshops. Uh, so I invite you to again join the Water Academy 2021. Up to which percentage can innovative technologies help to save water? Katana, you cannot uh, say to anyone the correct answer because this was a question connected to your session. All right, I will make five seconds for each answer, okay? All right, so 32%, I think that's the correct answer. Perfect. So the next question, companies across the food, beverages and agriculture sectors reported to the CDP that the financial impact of water risk amount to one, uh, one, 196 uh, billion dollars. The same companies evaluated the cost of addressing those risks at just 11 billion dollars. Is this statement true? Right now, closing. True, indeed. So we see that, of course, the water scarcity will be, uh, require some kind of um, financial investment, but it's still less than uh, mitigating the, the consequences of the, of, the, of the water scarcity. Great. Choose the correct statement about the current agri-food wastewater EU policy. Agriculture has been identified as the most as the major sustainable water management issue in the implementation of the water framework directive. So far, the nitrate balance in the groundwater from agriculture practices does not exceed the water framework directive. The successful implementation of the water 
framework directive does not depend strongly on the future development of agriculture. Okay. Awesome, you are all great because 81% that shows that uh, you are real water expert and you are real champions. <laughs> yes, it was the first agriculture has been identified as the major sustainable water management issue. Which of the following options has the highest EU policy impact on the business models? So measures limiting the conditions for fertilizer application, reuse of wastewater to irrigation water, food management of menu. Two seconds. Reuse is way too. All right, seventy-three percent. Well, I guess you need to join the session of Dimitra Aravani uh, from Netherlands, who delivered uh, the session on risk for the agriculture. So go ahead and uh, check her session why she is convinced about different opinion. Which phase of dairy production is most sensitive to draft conditions? Milk processing, feed production, cattle farming, milk packaging. Okay, two more seconds. Feed production, cattle farming. Well, it's almost 50-50, but the correct answer is feed production. Uh, the rest, which, who was voting for the cattle farming, I recommend you a session on the water footprint uh, delivered by um, Ertug Ertin. Uh, you will definitely enjoy this lecture. Which of the following technology trains can treat the wastewater of the food company to a quality fit for it reuse as processed water in the food company? Multiple answers are possible. So, mem uh, membrane bioreactor, reverse osmosis and disinfection, that's the first. Membrane reactor only, ultrafiltration and reverse osmosis. Uh, conventional activity sludge, ultrafiltration, reverse osmosis, disinfection. And the third option is Oh, uh, can I read it? It's conventional activated sludge, activated carbon, and disinfection. Okay, this is 18 people answered already. So let's see. All right, 83 people voted for the membrane, uh, for the membrane director of. Reverse osmosis. So let's see what are the correct answers. Perfect. Awesome. You are the champions. Good. When assessing the water supply demand ga uh, gap for cities, what is the most straightforward indicator to use to understand water availability? So pipe water supply capacity or available surface and groundwater in river basins. I see the correct answer is pipe water supply capacity. Please join the session of amazing uh, expert Jennifer, who was delivering a session for the municipality on um, water scarcity and implication, uh, business and um, environmental implications for the cities. When analyzing water is related to uh, infrastructure, sorry, this is, um, there is a mistake. How do you consider non-revenue water? only include the physical losses from the non-revenue water for the water supply demand gap, include physical losses for the water supply demand gap and take note of commercial losses for utility sustainability aspects, consider the sum of physical and commercial losses uh, for the wa water supply demand gap assessment. As I say in the question, there is a missing word infrastructure. 
So when analyzing water risk related to infrastructure, how do you consider non-revenue water? Consider some of physical and commercial losses. All right. So we have 14% of the champions who voted for the correct answer. And yeah, I definitely recommend this session of uh, Jennifer to um, really understand um, how the water risk um, should be measured. She has a lot of uh, experience also from the Indonesia. So if you are interested, go ahead for, for Water Academy 2021. Choose the correct statements about the integra uh, integration of the computer tools for water distribution system management. So it's integration of the computer system is always a very costly process. Integration of the computer systems requires the horizontal and the vertical approaches. And integration of the computer system requires to purchase all software for only one producer. It's a correct statement, there is only one. Okay, see, 1314. Integration of the computer system requires the horizontal and the vertical approaches. Amazing, you're great, you're champions. Integration of the computer system is always a very costly process. I would recommend to those, to those 19% to, to um, really watch this um, Dr. Bilka's uh, session because um, you will understand that um, it's really about uh, effective solutions. Uh, I see that uh, we are five minutes over, so uh, let's make uh, three more questions and then um, we can finish. So we had also a session on uh, improving uh, the, uh, the improving uh, the efficiency of the um, uh, of the water consumption in the builds, in buildings. So how many uh, square meters, uh, cubic meters of um, per year of water does a leaky toilet of 25 liters per hour uh, equate to? So how many cubic meters a year of hot water, that's a leaky toilet of 25 liters an hour. Okay, 219. Amazing, yes, that's the correct answer. How much water could be saved on average uh, thanks to accurate customer site leakage detection? Two percent. That was quite straightforward, but it's fifteen percent. One more question. This is uh, also an interesting one. Can you select the wastewater sources where nature-based solutions can be applied for water or wastewater treatment? So it's municipal wastewater, urban water. There are uh, multiple choices. So. Textile industry wastewater, chemical manufacturing, agricultural wastewater, mine drainage, refinery effluents, nuclear industry effluents, food industry effluent. Okay, now let's see. I think we really have champions here. So I will go now to the very last uh, uh, like the poll question. Will you check our online Water Academy 2001 in the SkillsMove platform? Amazing. <laughs> okay. I see that someone is really careful and not to become too smart. All right, so let's have a last um, slide about uh, how to join the platform. Uh, okay. I don't know what happened. Do you see the screen? I guess not. 
No, we can't right now. Mm -hmm. Sure, I did. I did push something and it made this kind of strange uh, pictures to come up. So, how to join the platform? You go to the uh, skillsmove.eu. Uh, you do uh, have to sign up, so you have to register using the email address, uh, then you have to also uh, provide some necessary uh, information about like, your background. Uh, and then when you are in the platform, please look for the learning path. So if you go into the search engine and you type in water, it will show you all the content which is related to water and you, uh, in the learning path, because first, uh, options you will receive the learning nuggets. Don't go there because they're separate ones. But if you go to the learning path for each session, uh, you will find uh, a set of video presentation and test. So by Sunday, you can still take the test and get a free certificate and access to this water academic content for free. After that, you are, we are going to close the system and uh, from the December 13th, the, the content is available for 30 euros, all the sessions, or 15 euro uh, sessions connected to one workshop. Thank you for your attention. For, this, for sorry for the little delay, and uh, yeah, I I pass uh, the floor to someone else, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> It's me, Rui. <laughs> Ivana, thank you, for, thank you very much for your contribution and also, of course, for testing our knowledge. It was quite fun. Um, and before we move on um, to, to end the, the event today, we will have uh, a last session. Uh, with us today is Maria do Rosario Palha. Uh, she's the Senior Sustainability Manager at Carlos Gulbenkian Foundation one of the key initiatives on water in Portugal. Yesterday we mentioned that 59% of the water used in Europe is dedicated to agricultural production, but actually in Portugal the agri-food industry accounts for 75% of water usage. Maria do Rosário is here with us to present the foundation's actions to promoting um, water efficiency and a new water culture in the agri-food industry in Portugal, across the entire value chain. So, please welcome Maria do Rosário. Bom dia. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, EIT team, for the invitation. Uh, so, the foundation uh, is uh, very known in Portugal, but I guess uh, a lot of you are not Portuguese, so I'll give you a bit of context about the foundation and how our uh, water work fits into uh, everything else that the foundation does. So the foundation was created in 1956 by the last will and testament of Kalust Sarkis Gulbenkian, uh, a philanthropist of Armenian origin who lived in Lisbon for 13 years before his death. The purpose of the foundation is to... Uh, improve the quality of life through art, charity, science, and education. So we do a very diverse uh, uh, sort of things. Uh, we have a museum, a modern art center, um, an orchestra, a choir, an art library, an archive. Uh, we have a, a scientific uh, research center and a garden. Uh, and then on top of all that, we also have a more uh, grant-giving activity where we implement projects uh, and uh, fund projects by uh, civil society organizations. Uh, and that's um, I'm from one of the programs within the grant giving activity. Um, OK. <laughs> so um, sustainable development is now one of the priority actions of uh, the foundation in its current strategy. Um, there were a few milestones uh, along the way to get us here, uh, particularly in 2019, the total disinvestment in fossil fuels, uh, and around the same time, uh, the uh, uh, we started um, doing some impact uh, investing, firstly with uh, mustard seed maize, uh, and since then we've expanded the portfolio. Um, and more recently, in 2020, uh, the Gulbenkian uh, Prize for Humanity, uh, which is awarded to uh, people or organizations w working towards climate mitigation and adaptation. 
Uh, so within the, um, the grant giving activity, we have different uh, programs with specific focus. One of those is the Sustainable Development Progr Program, which is the one that I represent. We work um, three areas, sustainability, cohesion and social integration, and innovation and impact investment. Um, sustainability is really the environmental strand of work. Um, and um, on that, we work on tackling the climate crisis, the valuing and protecting the ocean, and uh, pr uh, sustainable production and consumption patterns. Uh, within sustainable production and consumption patterns, of course, there are a lot of very important topics uh, that need to be addressed, and one of those, um, specifically in Portugal, is uh, water scarcity. Uh, as you m probably have heard uh, more than once uh, in this event, um, the World Resources Institute hanged uh, Portugal as having a high risk uh, of water stress by 2040. Um, and that was the starting point uh, for our work uh, in this very important topic. Uh, and we decided, this was in 2019, to work um, the water issue specifically in agriculture. And that's because exactly as Rui was saying, uh, in Portugal, uh, the agri-food industry represents 75% of total water used. Uh, this was the first time that we were talking, that we were working specifically uh, the, with the agricultural sector and also uh, the topic of water uh, zone. So we wanted to know um, a lot more about um, the sector, uh, how the water is used, what are the constraints that exist for the adoption of uh, more innovative technology. And so the first thing we did was to commission a study uh, on these topics to the Consumer Intelligence Lab. And so we launched this study of the water use in Portugal uh, last year. Uh, we have um, the studies available on our website. The full version is only in Portuguese, but there's a, a summarized version uh, in English, uh, if anyone's interested. Um, okay, so the study, uh, they spent, the research team spent more than a year um, doing this, talking with farmers. They visited more than uh, 50 farmers and uh, complemented the um, their findings with surveys to 460 farmers and 500 consumers. Um, and as I said, this was the starting point uh, for our work. And to know um, what to do, we, uh, what, sorry, <laughs> before that, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go through a few of the, the key takeaways from the study, which I, I think can be of added value to some of you. Um, and the first one was that measuring is still very critical. Um, although some progress is, is being made uh, towards efficient irrigate, irrigation systems, uh, the large majority of farmers in Portugal don't have water meter. That means water is not even being monitored, uh, so that it's very hard to implement uh, change um, in that way. One of the things that might explain that is because more than 60% of farmers say they do not pay for the water they use, and the other ones say that uh, the cost of water um, is not very relevant uh, in terms of their um, cost structure. Uh, so that might be one of the reasons that explains that. Also the fact that um, the water is a low cost in overall expenditure, um, can explain the, the delay in the adoption of more advanced technologies. Only a small number of farmers have implemented um, these technologies. Um, and, um, <laughs> sorry, uh, these technologies. So really what we need, we, the conclusion, it's not very surprising, uh, is that um, to implement technology, uh, there needs to be investment uh, and training of farmers. And what uh, this uh, research did, which was very interesting, was to uh, understand that, that there are different profiles of farmers um, and that those different profiles need different uh, engagement strategies uh, in order to do this transition towards more efficient practices. 
Uh, so uh, they've um, they've traced four profiles uh, the con that they've called conditioned uh, followers, leaders, and mentors. Conditioned uh, are around 38 percent, so the largest um, uh, the largest group uh, of these uh, profiles, and are the farmers who manage their activities on a year-to-year -year basis, uh, basis. So very focused. Uh, very dependent on their yield. Uh, and uh, this segment uh, needs a lot of support and close monitoring in order to transition to more um, efficient uh, practices. Then there are the followers. They also uh, think in short term, but they are already uh, paying attention to what is being done in the sector and to what other people tell them, mainly um, technical consultants and um, sectoral organizations. Then there are the followers, uh, the leaders, I'm sorry. Uh, for those, competitive advantage is, um, is already a driving force, and so they invest a lot in continuous improvement. And then there's a, a really small uh, per, but very important percentage of farmers that they've called mentors who really have um, sustainability as, and, and as water efficiency, obviously, uh, as mandatory uh, in the way they, they manage uh, their uh, activity. And they also, they think uh, in long term um, for everything they do. And they play a very important role in uh, engaging all other uh, farmers. They're really an example, and this is a picture of one of these mentors uh, that we've spoken uh, many times with. We've used them uh, as well as an example to reach uh, other farmers, uh, and it, it works really well. So it's a very, still a very small uh, percentage of mentors, but uh, with a very important role to play. Um, Okay, so this means uh, two-thirds of Portuguese farmers still need uh, a lot of close uh, monitoring in order to do this, uh, achieve this transition. Um, and obviously, there's uh, a wider uh, context that needs to be um, addressed and other stakeholders that need to be involved in this transformation. Uh, retailers, of course, uh, have... Um, have a strong influence both on consumers and, um, and farmers. 98% of Portuguese farmers sell within the national market, and of those, 85% uh, say that they do not need to comply with any water requirements. Uh, so there's a lot to be done um, with the retailers. Um, of course, citizens uh, play an important role as well in all their uh, in all their choices, and the majority uh, part of the study is also focused on the consumer perceptions and their um, uh, ha uh, habits in uh, water use. Um, and so, one of the conclusions is that the majority of the Portuguese people are still uh, ill-informed uh, about water and uh, water risks. Uh, and um, and don't use water uh, efficiently in their daily lives. So there's a lot to be done there. The media, of course, can play a role, can tell news stories. Um, and basically, we all have a, a role to play. Uh, in the case of the foundation, to define what to do next, we engaged uh, more than 30 stakeholders, representatives of the agri-food industry, uh, and ask them, show them the conclusions of the study, ask for their opinion, and what um, an institution like the foundation uh, could help. And um, we, uh, in those conversations, we decided that there were two priority things to be done. Uh, on the one hand, to accelerate uh, the demonstration of uh, best practices working directly with farmers, and in order to do that, we launched just before the summer a call for projects, uh, for demonstration projects. Um, five of, of those were recently approved. They'll reach uh, more than 700 farmers uh, in different from the north to the south of the country. Um, 
uh, it, I think it will be very interesting um, to see. They'll be uh, rolled out from now until the end of next year. So by that time, we'll have uh, a little more to say about those experiences. Um, and then another thing that is uh, a priority is the communication aspect of all of this uh, and to communicate the value of water in the food system and for the agri-food industry. Uh, there is still need to inform people in general about um, what has been done thus far. There are a lot of misconceptions about agricultural practices in general and one of the things that we were asked to do because the foundation has this reach uh, that sometimes farmers do not have is to, is to communicate a, a little better about what has already been done um, and um, and so we're working on that and we have implemented uh, or engaged with other partners in uh, a lot of activities. For instance, uh, there's a video uh, on our website that we launched uh, this year on the water, water, World Water Day. Um, it, it's really beautiful. I, enjoy, I invite you all to, to watch. Uh, it was done during the, the study, so it has stunning images of uh, farmers in Portugal. Uh, then we've also, we supported an exhibition, the Water Unfiltered Exhibition, which was also done in partnership with Aguas Portugal. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a very interesting exhibition um, that invites visitors to experiment and discover um, more about water. And one of the, those, those experiments was done, um, was inspired by the study. Uh, we've just launched another call for ideas also with Ciencia Viva. Uh, we've supported events and conferences and we've, we're one of the founding members of the Water Management Pact that uh, was presented yesterday. Uh, so um, I guess a lot of activities but all related with these true priorities, communication and working with the agri-food sector. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be here. Uh, all of your projects are so interesting and companies and uh, I wish you all uh, great success and thank you again for the invitation. Thank you very much, Maria do Rosario. Um, and as uh, Maria mentioned, uh, and this was actually a recurring idea throughout the entire event, we need collaboration among all stakeholders involved in order to achieve real change. Um, and of course, water scarcity cannot be faced from a single angle. We need uh, a systemic approach that includes all stakeholders, so from farmers to, to the industry, to policymakers and citizens. And that is why, as part of the EIT Water Scarcity Project, we also focus on reaching out to the wider audience, so to the citizens. Uh, for the past two years, we delivered over six actions that have reached over a million citizens, including online publications in English and Spanish, some of them also available in Italian and Greek. We also launched an Instagram campaign around World Water Day through Food Unfolded, which is the EIT food branch working to reach the general audience. Um, a topic as complex as water scarcity requires input from people across the board um, and as it affects actually literally everyone. Um, in Greece, we created three audio stories based on interviews and oral history accounts. Um, so representatives from academia, NGOs and locals narrate a story on water scarcity. These are stories about the past, the present, and the future. Um, and taking into in consideration the societal part of water, and based on these interviews, we are presenting you now in an absolute premiere, uh, a story on rain-making rituals in the Greek Orthodox religion by the local communities. Στην Ορθόδοξη Λατβία έχουμε τις, τις λιτανίες που γίνονται για την κροκή που συμμετέχει ε, και η Εκκλησία, δηλαδή ο τοπικός ιερέας με την κοινότητα κάνουν συγκεκριμένες σπουδές γύρω γύρω στα χωράφια, να αγιαστούν κλπ. προκειμένου να προκαλέσουν την κροκή την οποία χρειάζονται 
Αυτά γίνονται κυρίω στι οικονομικέ τι οποίε χρειάζονται, πάσχουν από λυψηδρία. Δεν είχε έρθει πάλι βροχή. Δεν είχαν αρχίσει να είναι καλέ πηγέ. Ήταν γύρω στο 70. Ε, 8, 96 που ήταν βροχιά. Και λίγο το νερό και σου λέει: Κάναμε την Ιταλία. Ξεκινούσαν από εδώ από την Ποκόσμο, όπω έβαζαν τα ζώα στη στάνη, να πεινάνε τα ζώα, να μην έχουν. Να υποφέρουν και αυτά να είναι και δύο τέο. Ο κόσμο δεν ήστερε. Και ξεκινούσαν δηλαδή με πίστη και κλαίγαν, το νιώθαν αυτό. Γιατί μπροστά τα παιδιά. Με φανάρια, λέγανε το κύριε Λέισον, κύριε Λέισον, ξέρουν τα παιδιά, ξέρουν οι παπάδες, δηλαδή με πίστη. Πήγαμε από το χωριό με τα πόδια και πατάγαμε τρεις ώρες να πάμε στο μοναστήρι, να πάρουμε την εικόνα και να πάμε από τη βόρεια πλευρά, παίρναμε την εικόνα και τον γυρίζαμε γύρω γύρω στο νησί για να μας βρέξει. Σε κάθε εκκλησία λοιπόν σταματούσαν και κάνανε τη Λέις, που είναι για την Ιταλία. Όλα αυτά, να περάσει η εικόνα, και να τη φέραμε στο χωριό, κρατήσαμε την εικόνα στην Άγιο Νικόνα, στην πλατεία, μία εβδομάδα. Εγώ θυμάμαι το εξή που ήταν ο Παπάγι Βαδάρο, το θυμάμαι πάρα πολύ καλά. Εγώ περμηνάμουν τότε σε 8 χρονό, 9 χρονό περμηνάμουν. Έκανα με την παράκτηση, γονατίσε όλο ο κόσμο τρει φορέ κάτω στην εκκλησία. Και ο παπά πάμε γρήγορα, γιατί δεν θα προλάβουμε. Και όταν βγήκαμε από την εκκλησία να πάμε στο σπίτι, κινδυνέψαμε. Ήτανε. Οι δρόμοι γεμάτη νερά. Τόσο ήταν η κίση μας δηλαδή. Και τώρα τελευταία πάλι, είναι πριν τρία χρόνια, έγινε ξανά με τον ειδούμενο, τον ειδούμενο. Εμείς ξεκινήσαμε να κάνουμε μια λιτανία πριν τέσσερα χρόνια. Μόλις πάνω στους αλλιούς, φωνάζαμε. Να πείσουν τις εικόνες κάτω, να κάνουμε ένα τσιγάρο. I would say we can do a round of applause. Um, if you want to know more about this story, please ask. Uh, today we, we have with us the creative mind behind uh, the scenes, Evgenia Tianu, uh, who has been collaborating with us all year. Um, we really hope you have enjoyed this video and of course the sessions we had throughout the morning, but also yesterday. Once again, I would like to thank all speakers for sharing their invaluable insights and also to congratulate all the scale-ups present here today. I wish you good luck for your scaling up process. Um, thank you very much as well for everyone working behind the scenes to make this event possible to EIT Food CLC South, especially Elvira, Miriam and her team, uh, Evgeny, uh, Rafael from Biazul, Eva and the all the tech team and the support team. And of course, thanks to all of you who have been here in Lisbon with us at Museu do Orient, but also following us online uh, for staying, of course, all along. You can subscribe to our newsletter to stay in touch, uh, to stay up to date on all current and upcoming activities. And that being said, I really hope you have a great weekend. Thank you very much and obrigado.